Hello and welcome to the show here on Monday afternoon with myself, Shane Stapleton, joined as ever by Michael Verney. Michael, you were down at the Kilkenny uh, final over the weekend. I've been watching games across the board myself. Reminder, we're brought to you by OlderRetro.com. Use the promo code our game, and you'll get 15% off any of the brilliant range that they have there, including maybe the likes of this brilliant down jersey, that lovely Mayo one there. Maybe you're from a, um, a club that has the old green over red, and you're thinking, eh, that wouldn't be a bad one for me to get. Well, no better place to go than uh, OlderRetro.com. Michael, so much happened over the weekend, and um, you know, what's the first thing that comes to mind when you're trying to reflect on that weekend that was? Well, it, I'd be, it, it's a parochial one for me, Shane, and it's the reason why I wore the green and red. Uh, my good buddy, Andrew Sullivan, regular watcher of the show, steered the Borough Senior Camogie team to their, only their second ever senior title at the weekend. A great win uh, over Shinron in the final, one by six in the wind-up. Um, and it's a funny one, you know, you're kind of, you know, when they're celebrating, he wakes up Sunday morning, I'm sure he woke up this morning, he's dying, and the boys that, a good mates involved with him, uh, Shane Murphy and Ollie Nolan are involved with him as well, to be very friendly with, you You would have met them on my stag, they were in good form that night, but sure it's were. funny, you'd be dying Sunday morning, you'd be dying Monday morning, but you're dying, but you're, like, you're living, you're, like, you're, the, you're just like the, how should I say, the happiness that's oozing out through you, I'd say is unbelievable, your head is not feeling good, your body's not feeling good, but your brain is just on cloud nine after achieving something unbelievable over the weekend. And, and then boys uh, are getting ready now for a Leinster senior campaign because Ryan has won the two intermediate All-Irelands back-to-back who they bet along the way. They're going into the senior now, but I'm sure they won't be thinking about that for a couple of weeks. So that's the, that's probably that, what stands out to me over the weekend. But the local angle is, that's what club is really, isn't it? It's yeah, what, sure. what tugs your own heartstrings. Yeah, actually, I, I was chatting to my father over the weekend and he was telling me about the Burris Lee Camogie uh, team the in, in the Intermediate County semi final. He was saying the match was level after 60 minutes, level again after two periods, uh, two periods of 10 minutes, and then more, Burris won by three after two further five minute periods. And he said it was unbelievable excitement. So that's, that's what you want, really. Uh, I had a great weekend watching GA myself, including the Our Game coaching clinic down in Longford at Father Manning Gales. Absolutely brilliant watching Colin Nally. New Longford manager Paddy Christie and also uh, uh, Davy Burke, who we've had on the show plenty of times, given the coaching clinic. I'll play a little clip in a little while. And just a reminder, we do have that coaching clinic coming up this Friday at uh, NACE GAA, and that's going to be an absolute cracker. So really looking forward to that. But I, I think coming out of the weekend, you were looking at a certain tweet which suggested that maybe there's a, a new goat in, time. He's, uh, in town. He's always been among the goats, but maybe now he's the head kid. Well, I just thought it was interesting. Like Eddie Brennan has played with, uh, he's probably played with three of the greatest hurlers. No, four to five of the greatest hurlers of all time in DJ Henry, probably Tommy Walsh, JJ Laney, and TJ Reid. And I just thought it was really interesting. And before anybody asks me or anything like that, I'm, there's loads more I could add to that list, but they're the five I've picked out. But I just thought it was interesting that Eddie tweeted over the uh, yesterday uh, during the Shamrocks game. He says TJ is the the goat. He said. Then now the time is up on this argument. The greatest hurler with the greatest hurling brain. Um, I just I just thought it was interesting for you know for a guy who's played with all those players and particularly Henry would be the one that would stand out. Henry would be widely acknowledged by a lot of people as the greatest of all time. But the longer TJ Reid's career goes on, the better he gets. Like there was probably some doubts about him this year, particularly after that taking off a half time against Galway, and he ends up being nominated for hurler of the year. That you know that catch in in, mid, in the middle of the park yesterday, Richie made a clearance and uh, just a joke. Like he's coming from another parish and his hand goes in and he ends up. The only disappointing thing was they didn't put over the free. He ruined for us. He ruined that moment of you know he did something brilliant, but unfortunately he didn't finish it off. And it was a rare rare miss. But uh, the longer TJ Reid's career goes on, the better he gets, and I think the better he will be remembered. And I definitely think. Um, I don't, it's it's less it's becoming less of a 60 40 in Henry's favor it's even probably it's 50 50 really and maybe it's just a recency bias now because we're seeing TJ and in the last couple of years particularly he's doing it with club and county the whole year round but like that's it's such an interesting debate and from a Bally Hale Shamrock's point of view to say that you know they're debating over two of the best hurlers in the history of the game that are also two hurlers within their club it's phenomenal really yeah, since I suppose the, the three parts of the club combined in 72, the fact that they've won 20 county titles in that period of time is unbelievable. What a testament to that club. Um, I suppose, like, 
if you're to there is recency bias in it but like he's approaching 35 he's still doing it with the club you could imagine him doing it for the next five years with the club and they're not going anywhere because they'll have adrian mullen who's just going from strength to strength and own cody leading that team they're definitely not going Niall Short all coming on and doing a dummy hand pass and doing a DJ-esque score off the hurl from under the stand as well. And he's only in sixth year. Yeah, like absolutely incredible. And we'll be talking about young young guns when we talk about St. Finbars in a while. But um, like, so we're talking about TJ doing it when he's that bit older. To be fair, Henry Shefflin won hurler of the year when he was 33, mm. which, you know, TJ Reid won it back in, was it 2015 he won it? 15, yeah. So at that stage, you know, he's that bit younger. He's in the, the middle of his 20s. So that that in some ways gives TJ, or sorry, gives Henry a little bit of an edge that he led Kilkenny over the line to an All-Ireland at 33, dragging him out of nowhere against Galway in that particular game. So if you were in, if you were, I suppose, in the camp of team, team Henry, you'd be pointing to something like that. But it's a fair old debate. And we want to get those comments in. Let us know what you think. Joe Butler says, TJ, like wine, it gets better with age. Yeah, like he, it's phenomenal. I think what he's doing now, really, it's that that 2012 quarter final against Limerick, and he's basically been doing it nearly every day for the guts of the last decade. I'd say he probably had a by his standards a probably a quiet 2016 when he was reigning hurler of the year that year. Um, but just some of the performances, and you know, it's funny. I I don't put all the stock in winning games, and I know you said Henry won hurler of the year and dragged Kilkenny over the line in 12. TJ has dragged, you know. Not an average Kilkenny team, but a Kilkenny team that doesn't stack up with those teams Henry was on. And he's dragged them to, you know, three Leinsters in a row, uh, dragged them to within an inch of Limerick in the All-Ireland final last year. Uh, to me, I place as much stock in that as winning. Um, the teams Henry played on were a lot stronger than the ones TJ has played on. And to me, I didn't really put even more stock in performances when everybody's focusing on TJ Reid. In, when they're playing Kilkenny everybody's focused on him if we stop him we have a great chance of winning with, with Henry's team we have to stop Henry we have to stop Eddie we have to stop Taggy we have to stop Larkin we have to stop Richie Power do you know what I mean we have to stop Martin Comerford like he, the Kilkenny forward line generally has been interchangeable particularly in the last four to five years and the main one they have to stop is TJ and he still rises high above it Um, and just to see even yesterday Shane just the interviews after how much that meant to him they've had so much tragedy in Ballyhale um, the last four to five years even it's 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 crazy the amount of tragedy and so sad Um, the, the scenes down there like they, they mentioned regularly a lot of them like like having to carry coffins through the parish and it's awful and it's it happens it's happened uh way more often than, than you'd imagine it should happen in a, in a natural kind of world but uh to see the emotion in his voice um, after the, the win yesterday, everything that he's won, and I'd say that meant as much yesterday as any title he has ever won. Yeah, absolutely. So we're going to talk about some of the comments that are coming in here. Fergus Butler says, Dunloy versus Cushendall was an absolute cracker in Corrigan Park. Cushendall had too many wides, and Cunning was unerring from freeze until the last few minutes. Uh, any thoughts on the red card, Joe? So this is uh, Richard Hogan asking Joe Butler there about the red card for Paddy Mullen. We'll come to that in a little bit of uh, time. Liam O'Neill, I'm not a St. Finbar's man, but it was great to see them win the final yesterday after 29 years with an exciting team as well. The double is still in on. Obviously, they have the football final to come up. Uh, Paul Young, Shamrocks look like they had the extra man. Serious outfit. Uh, the team to beat. Great show, lads. And John Maher echoes that. Great show, lads. What a great team, Barry Hale, Aaron. All credit to James Stevens. Uh, what a goal Owen Gilfoyle would have uh, would have been only for hitting the post. Bally Hale, one of the all-time great teams. Uh, I think Kilmani that was Brick Ross Feeling. I think that was Ross Feeling actually when he came on. Oh, that was the and, doubles one, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, and it was. it was the exact same as um, Aaron Shannon's chance in against Galway in eighteen. Yeah. He actually he actually turned away as well. He turned away kind of half to celebrate and they hit the post. Would have been really interesting if it had, if it had gone in, but um, like I think Bally Hale were only in second or third gear. And when when the, we'll talk about the sending off, but if if anything, that just that, I think, made them realise we need to up with the gear, and they upped it probably two gears thereafter. Yeah, Kilmurray, a brick, and Ennis Diamond play out, played out and never say die. Clare, senior football championship semi-final. Ennis Diamond took the game to extra time with a goal at the death, level after extra time, level after five penalties. Ennis Diamond win on sudden death. So uh, th there's so many games that have gone to extra time. We'll talk about down later on. Both Kilku and Warren Point had been taken to extra time three times during the championship this year, which is quite incredible. Uh, Lancashire senior hurling final. Keown Craig of Glasgow against Full and Gales. Winning captain, thanked coach, physiotherapist, psychologist, kit man, sub goalie, strength and conditioning, all the same person. Ah, brilliant. <laughs> ah, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. 
Cash is king. That game against Galway a few years ago in Nolan Park was unreal, those catches. He had, he had nine brilliant catches, TJ Reid, that day. Uh, Jay Quan is good for Kilkenny hurling that Bala Hale are so dominant. Uh, lads, Ethan Toomey, for 19 years of age, is class. Set up 1-6 for Bears. Big, strong guy with Ben O'Connor. Bright future ahead. Uh, some conditions in that game. And John O'Sullivan, this is the most recent comment we've had in. Bally Hale, Bally Gunner, and the Pierce top three in the country. Yeah, we're look, I'm wondering if St. Finbar is going to edge into that now. And we might as well come to that game. St. Finbar is ending a 29-year famine run since they last won a county title in Cork. And the conditions were absolutely horrendous. And uh, I've seen videos of Cork. I think there was a street in Douglas where there was like kegs that were stacked at the side of a pub that were being picked up by the water and rolling down, or sorry, floating down the street. So 15,000 people showed up at Parky Cueve uh, for the Little All Ireland, I suppose, if you want to call it that way. Back in the late 70s and stuff like that, there was over 30,000 at some of these games. But 15,000 day uh, people on a day where you, the ducks were jacking it in. That's unbelievable. Yeah, there would have been 20, Shane, realistically, if it was, uh, you know, what a normal, we'll say, uh, October's day would be. Um, just saw Buff did a video coming up the steps as they were walking around through the parade and the rain coming down. Like, it was, mm. you know, it was like an ice rink nearly by the end of the game and even that, that last free that went in around the bar square, like, there's a good bit of surface water on the ground. That's how much it had rained. Um, and such a... Such a polished display, you'd have to say, by a young Bars team in atrocious conditions. You know, if you were looking at it beforehand, you probably would have favoured the Rockies in conditions like that, just because probably they're a bit more experienced. But an unbelievable performance by the, by the Bars. Ben Cunningham, I couldn't get over that. He was only 18 as well. Like, what a specimen of a man. And you look at Ben O'Connor as well, and obviously Ethan Toomey, and like, they are here for the long haul and duty free. Uh, though, like they, the bars will be around for a long time, and those sort of players in the over the next couple of years will probably be driving Cork forward as well. Yeah, really incredible stuff. Like the, I have to say, like you, I I was watching back the the highlights, and when they mentioned, you know, the, um, that Ben o Ben Cunningham was only eighteen, I was like, was he not on the Cork under twenty panel a year <laughs> and a half ago when they won two of them in the space of uh, something like six weeks? And I was like. This is absolutely outrageous. And, you know, you mentioned some of the other players, uh, Brian Hayes, the way he finished off that brilliant solo run from Conor Cahillan, the hand pass across. Like, we, I've often said I thought Conor Cahillan should probably be a bit more of a front runner for the Cork Senior Hurling team. And then the way he scored the second goal after a brilliant uh, move involving Ben O'Connor, who in horrendous conditions showed good, I suppose, sidestepping through traffic and then a one handed sort of brick flick to Ethan Toomey, who did a hand pass over the top for Cahillan. And what a brilliant finish there. Uh, I wonder in the first half, are the Rockies a bit sore about Michael O'Halloran not getting a penalty? Because I thought he was held back. And, you know, I thought that was a penalty there. But those two go goals early in the second half definitely decided this one. They surely did. And, like, fair play to Gerald Cunningham. Um, probably was maybe much maligned um, up in Dublin after after a spell there. He obviously got involved with Cork then. But he's gone back to it. He's gone back to his own club with his own young fella involved uh, and he's brought them over the line for the first time in 29 years. Unbelievable win. He just talked about it after, what it meant to everybody. Just says it means everything. We've had some tough times over the years. To manage a team with massive support from a, uh, from a great back, a backroom team and to have two sons and a nephew and cousins involved in the team, it does make it extra special. It's our club, our family. It is extra special. We've been far away uh, from this scene for a long time and it's fantastic to see both the new generation of our supporters and the older lads. Some players who I'd have played with myself absolutely roaring crying as it means so much to them. And like that's what it does mean to clubs the length and breadth of the country. Like, uh, the, like there'd be a lot of uh, tears shed after losing games, but there'd be some amount of tears of joy shed around clubs uh, Saturday and Sunday and for the, for the next few weekends as well. Uh, just especially when that famine is ended and when you when something happens maybe that seemed like it was so far away and for the Bars winning, obviously it, it was so far away. It was 29 years away. Um, so just uh, fair play to him. Uh, he obviously got the one up on, on Louis McQueen there. I'm sure the Rockies would be back, but they'd be disappointed probably with how they performed yesterday. Um, from a Bars point of view, we mentioned about the youth as well. Like for a youthful squad, a generally quite youthful squad to get over the line, that's a great sign for, you know, potentially getting over the line again uh, three or four more times potentially over the next seven or eight years just because they have it they have it in the psyche now that they can win a county title at this age and that they can potentially be dominant. Now, Cork is very competitive, but it's great for a lot of those guys that they have a county board on the, on the county, a county title on the board so early in their career. 
Yeah, because I'm thinking there, there's other clubs out there who probably still have that monkey on their back, you know, like Dune, for example, and we'll be talking about how they didn't make it through their county semi-final this weekend. But getting that first title kind of just blows away the kind of this notion of, I suppose, the weight hanging on your shoulders when you're trying to, to, to end up, you know, sort of close out that period of history where you've been unsuccessful. Like, going back to 1993, so many of these players, I'm not sure if any of these St. Finbar's players were alive when they last won it. And I'm looking at the team now and I see Damien Cahillan, I see Billy Hennessy, who's involved with the, well, both senior panels uh, for Cork in recent years. We've already mentioned Ben O'Connor, Ethan Toomey, Connor Cahillan, Ben Cunningham's a big player, Brian Hayes is a big player, Jack Cahillan, someone we've talked about as a future. Jack magic, yeah, he's magic, yeah. So, like, if this team can win a county, which it has, won a county title this year, if, if they can perform okay in Munster, if they can come back and win another Cork title, which will be tough again next year, like in a year or two, this is a team that could quite easily be challenging and, and putting it up to anyone in the country. But of course, in both codes, they might be doing that because, you know, obviously they got to an All-Ireland semi-final last year in club football. So they'll be back there. So this, this is a club that's set for glorious years again. Yeah, serious potential there, yeah. Massive, massive potential there. Their age profile, I suppose, it's, with someone like Ben O'Connor, it's a matter of... Uh, I suppose trying keeping it, keeping him within the GA probably, um, because he's going to he's going to be he's going to have potential rugby offers down the line. He's obviously going to be playing senior school rugby as well, but uh, the potential is definitely there. Um, and I saw Buff was down in the bars after last night as well, and in the, right in right in the middle of him. It's mad to see just when you actually see it, just how young they are though as well. Like you know, we talk about nineteen and eighteen, and they're big lads in the field, but they are very very young men, and I think. Um, I think it will, it's a great sign of their future that they were able to get a county title on the board so early. And for someone like Damien Callan, who's much maligned as well, um, and he's been soldiering long and hard with them through probably barren times as well, great for him to get a county title as well. I'm sure like when he looks back at the end of his career, whenever that does come, unless you know if they go on and do something better, this is going to be a massive, massive highlight of his career. Yeah, Richard Hogan here, and I'm presuming this is with a Tiger Woods accent. <laughs> Conditions were tough out there, really, really tough. Yeah, and, you have to join uh, the really, really tough at the end. Yeah, Grodogo Grekod says, maybe it's my Bruins, uh, blue, saffron and blue tinted glasses, but I think whoever wins between Ballier and Aero Guinness on Sunday will beat St. Finbar's. That's a fairly mouthwatering county final to look forward to in Clare, by the way. Adrian McGrath says, only saw the highlights, but the Cork game uh, looked like it... Uh, a lot of the scores were unopposed physically compared to, say, the Dune Kilmalik match. Or else you could look the other way and say the quality, considering the conditions, was pretty good. And Parky Cueve is a very different venue to Brough. I mean, Parky Cueve is wide open. Brough, by comparison, you know, it is a sort of more of a club pitch. Uh, Niall Heffernan says Dune versus Kilmalik was absolute savagery. Unbelievable physicality and brutal conditions. Brilliant game. Absolutely gutting for Dune, who had hero uh, heroes all over the field and were probably the better team. Just on that, uh, Shane, isn't it funny how. Different county championships are they're played differently. Like um, I was talking, Dan Shannon was down for our fundraiser the other night, and he was just talking about the Kilkenny championship. He said he's played in Waterford uh, Club Championship for thirty years, but he said it's nothing like the Kilkenny championship. He said it's it's so like you know he said kind of tactics go out the window a lot of the time. It is about like you need to be coaching lads and training lads to protect, to try and win their own ball. I was chatting to Jackie Tyrrell about the Kilkenny championship the other day, and he just said about Seamus O'Dwyer, the village manager. He said he's a great understanding of what it takes to be in, you know, get to those knockout stages in Kilkenny and be in county finals. And he just said, Kilkenny, Kilkenny Club Championship is about basically savage work rate and savage physicality. And there's obviously other bits and pieces with it, but there's definitely uh, a difference between them. Say, I think the Limerick Championship is starting to look a bit like the Kilkenny Championship did. Cork then, it looks completely different. So it's like accents almost. You know, there's different accents in different places. There's different um, styles and hurling is played differently in different counties. But you definitely say, uh, and I know the conditions were really tough in Parky Cueve yesterday, but you would say that club hurling in Cork is played a lot differently than their near neighbours in Limerick. And then if you move across a small bit, it's different than in Kilkenny as well. Yeah, and uh, I'm also um, well, uh, or been told here as well, that the Inish Gara Castle Martyr game in the Premier Intermediate final, which ended 112 to 15 a draw, that that was an absolute cracking game there. I think somebody had a comment in there, but uh, maybe it's just slipped past me there. Um, so the next thing we'll talk about is Shamrocks. Like you were down in Nolan Park and you saw them beat the village. And for a finish, they beat them pretty well 121 to 211. James Stevens, you know, they were okay in the first half. Gilfoy got a nice goal couple of other players like some Matt Root was playing pretty well 
But as the game wore on, like even the red card for Paddy Mullen, it seemed to make no difference. And look, I'd, the class shone. The class really shone for them as the game went on. And I was kind of looking at Key and Kenny playing centre back, thinking probably one of the very few players for the village that is a classy hurler is probably too close to his own goal. Like the village wouldn't have had that many silky players. It was more dogged stuff. And you would have thought with the extra man, they wouldn't be the ones pumping the ball long and, you know, wearing the hand off Richie Reid. But it worked the other way around. Ballyhale started to use the ball a bit better. And I think the village were just determined to shoot themselves in the foot for most of the second half. And they never adjusted to the fact that they had an extra man. It's a funny old game, uh, Shane. Never really caught fire. Even uh, after Gilfoyle's goal, um, the village probably needed to kick on a small bit. Instead of kicking on, the Shamrocks got the next seven points. And I think there was 12 minutes between Gilfoyle's goal and Niall Brazel's free at the end of the first half. Um, and they really wanted the half-time whistle because Ballyhale, Ballyhale potentially were going to run away. They were three up at the break. Um, the village came out and got the first point, and then Paddy Mullen got a red card. Uh, I'm kind of on the fence about it. It was I thought it was very wild. Um, I thought it was very wild. Uh, in the context of the game, it was a harsh red card because the referee let everything go. Um, the first 20 minutes, he hardly blew. The first three was after about seven or eight minutes, I think. Um, but you can you'll probably just bring it up here now, yeah. You'll be able to see it here. It was it was very uh, it was very wild. There's no point in saying any different. But we'll just see it here. Yeah. So it's the second pull, and he does strike the man quite high. And like you know, talking to Kilkenny people over the years, and you know how often they reference the Paddy Maher strike on Michael Rice. I'm sure there'd be consistency there, and they'd be saying, "Well, look, we thought that was a red card back then. We reckon that's a red card now." I don't know. I mean, it is wild. It's loose. I was there thinking, as it happened, that's an orange card somewhere in between the two. But I, I doubt too many people in Ballyhale would have that much complaints about it. If they'd go on and lose the game, maybe so. But, you know, as things stand, I think most of them are probably like, yeah, probably just about. It's funny. I think if it had happened anywhere else in the field, I don't think you would have been sent off. It was right in front of uh, the village backroom team. Uh, a couple of the selectors were kind of in up there. The, the crowd. Uh, a few of them got stuck in. James yeah. Barry or Peter Barry was getting stuck in. Very funny, actually, because um, the Mullins were all together getting a picture after, and I saw Peter Barry coming over to all of them, and in particular to Paddy Mullin. I kind of just laughing with him. So <laughs> they were they were obviously fine after. But I I, th I think there's a fair chance if that had happened anywhere else that it wouldn't have been a send sending off. The crowd kind of got in on top of the referee. I'd say maybe felt a bit of pressure there. But I would say I probably the same as you. Um, it was probably between a yellow and a red. So, like, what do you do? 50% of the time you give a yellow, 50% of the time you give a red. Listen, Ballyhale definitely won't be complaining. They're going to be without Paddy Mullen the next day. But that forced them to go up a gear. They hit the next two points. Um, and they, like, they looked a different team after he went off, I have to say. It did look like Ballyhale were playing 15 against 14 the other way around. We see it so often it happens. King Kenny was kind of free. He was the one that was kind of sweeping then. Ballyhale just played around him. Colin Fenley came into it. Dara Corkham motored in from, from halfback. Richie Reid got on with... Richie Reid looked like he was the free player when Paddy Mullen went off. And their halfback line was totally dominant thereafter. Evan Shefflin as well. Um, TJ was obviously still pulling the strings. And, like, it's such a killer. I said it to you on the show last Thursday about, like, how Jackie was saying, like, they'd look after Cha and Henry and TJ and Owen Reid had hit them for 1-3. You know, Joey Cuddy hit them for 1-2 yesterday. That sort of a player that you're maybe not keeping as close of an eye on really, really hurt them yesterday. Um, I thought the village lacked nothing um, in terms of effort, but there was just a massive difference in class between the two teams. You, you just would have to say there was. And, and you see someone like Niall Shortall coming on and what he's able to do. And even just looking down through the... The Ballyhale uh, subs, you know, Kevin Mullen was listed at 24. He uh, he came on an All Ireland final this year. Did he start the All Ireland final this year against Ballygunner? I can't remember if he started this year, but he's definitely been a starter regularly over the yeah, last year. Yeah, you know, Owen Reid was listed at 23, I think, and he's obviously played. Uh, he picked up his 11th county medal along with TJ and Colin Fenley yesterday. And Colin Fenley was talking after about how Henry actually spoke to the Ballyhale lads on the Friday night. I'll just go through what he said, actually, because it's obviously been a very, very hard time in Ballyhale, as we said earlier. He said, I know it happens to other places, but I don't think it ever happens as big as this when you just lose one after the other. It's tragedy after tragedy. Not only the two young lads that passed away a few years ago, so he just referencing Owen Doyle and Eugene Aylward. He said, but for this to happen this year again is absolutely heartbreaking. We had Henry in the dressing room talking on Friday night 
Uh, Pat Hoban and Henry would be very good friends. It was a big surprise for us, but just the emotion in Henry's voice, there was just pure silence in the room. Everyone walked out of there just ready and the hunger there. He didn't say anything about Paul. That's his brother, Paul, who sadly passed away this year. But you could see it. You could just see the emotion in him and the hunger that he'd love to be out there. And, um, you know, I kind of said in my report in Independent today, like, hell had no, uh, no fury like a woman scorn. But, like, hell had no fury like a Ballyhale Shamrocks team with a point to prove and who are going for five in a row and are as hungry as ever. And, like, Colin looks so hungry. TJ looks so hungry. There's absolutely no element of complacency whatsoever. And to me, like, they never they never went out of fourth gear yesterday. Uh, and that's such a, an exciting and tantalising prospect going forward. And TJ referenced it after, like, they'd love another crack at Ballygunner. That hurt them massively. Um, and I think that would be... That would be up there with Portumna playing Ballyhale in, was it 09 down in Semple Stadium? If those two were to meet again, it's as close as you would probably ever get to an inter-county game, the build-up to an inter-county game in the club game. And I just hope it happens, but there's a lot of hurdles to be uh, to be jumped before then. Yeah, uh, Wouldn't you just love an inter-county type championship of all the county champion winners? Imagine like you had a group with Ballyhale, Ballygunner, St. Thomas's, Schlock Neil, you know, for example... And then the bars and Ballier and you know whoever else on the other side and it was run like maybe the way the all ireland championship is being run at the moment that would just be unbelievable considering like especially if you're into your club and you you're familiar with all the players that play at this level you're already thinking of matchups and like even throw the likes of clonlara in there and you have the likes of john conlon and maybe colin galvin assuming he can stay 100 percent fit i mean i just think that would be class uh, just some of the people who did the scoring for bally hale so you've already kind of mentioned tj reed he scored six two for play joey cutter he won two colin fennelly got three dara corkland and ronan corkland got two each as did owen cody and then evan shefflin richie reed adrian mullen and niall shorthall got a point geez adrian mullen is going from strength to strength like when the team was not exactly motoring at their best he did some great stuff there was one time on the same side as the camera that he soloed into traffic and did a little flick over a lad's head and then popped it to i think own cody and ultimately it led to a score and i, I just think he's going on to be the leader of the kilkenny and well obviously the valley hale team in the next couple of years like the sky's the limit for him yeah i actually thought he was quiet yesterday by by his standards he worked very hard but he was one freeze um, yeah he won a few freeze he was um he didn't get the ball into his hand, I'd say, until about 15 or 20 minutes in. Same with Colin, actually. They were kind of quiet and the village were doing well, particularly in defence. And the village just went man for man, in fairness to them. Um, but they were, you know, they weren't particularly clever with some of the ball they were hitting in. Hitting in Like, there was four or five balls plonked down on top of Luke Scanlon or plonked down on top of Owen Gilfoyle. And, like, it was amazing to, to look at the parade beforehand. Like, Bally Hale, a lot of them are giants as well. Whatever about them being great hurlers and great athletes, like, you've Brian Butler. The James Stevens are actually, they're a small team. Like, oh, so yeah. They yeah. are a small team, yeah. And, like, that's why you're surprised to see them not playing to the corners. Like, why would you be putting down high ball on top of Brian Butler on Luke Scanlon? Or, do you know what I mean? Like, it just, yeah. to me, that didn't really make much sense. Like, well, how bad you know, was the weather? Like, it, because there was bits of rain. You could see the rain coming when you were watching on TV. It's not really a day that would suit like pinning the ball to the corners, turn, take on your man. First half was okay. First half was okay. Um, second half got a bit wet and messy, but like conditions weren't, no, it wasn't anything like Parky Cueve. It was still conducive. Like you saw TJ playing a lovely ball into the corner at one stage. Like they were playing the ball around really well. Just thought the village didn't use the ball well and like, they made Richie Reid look like a hero, I thought, when they actually went down to 14 men, when, when Bally Hale were at 14 men. He looked like he was free, and it's like they were withdrawn players. It's funny how a lot of um, a lot of teams just don't deal with that extra man well, and the village didn't deal with it well yesterday. It actually, it was a, you know, it was a help to Bally Hale, funnily enough. But, like, Bally Hale were so good at retaining possession, you know, TJ yeah, Reid yeah. was a big part of that, that when he got the ball around the middle, he didn't just turn and plonk it. He looked to bring lads into play, and... Dara Corcoran drove on from the back. Ronan Corcoran, who always seems to score a point or two, was able to drive on. Own Cody started to step up. Now, I did really think that um, Adrian Mullen played well throughout the game, but fair enough, I take your point. It mightn't have been in his hand, and he didn't maybe do all that much scoring, but I thought he was great all game. Um, but I do think that there's just... Like, when I watch how James Stevens played in that game, it surprises me that they got to a county final. I'm not trying to do them down, but maybe it was just on the day. They just seemed to really lack quality. Yeah, um, 
Yeah, just I, I just as I said to you there earlier, I just didn't think they played. Uh, I didn't think they played to their strengths yesterday at times because like, they did have time on the ball hitting it in sometimes, and it was just you no, know, it was it wasn't good ball going in. They have low, they have a really lively inside line, and Ty Dwyer done did very well early on in particular. Got two lovely scores. Um, they probably didn't feed him him enough either. I think I think there was a switch at half time anyway. I think Joey Holden was on Ty going Dwyer at the start. Uh, I'm not sure if it was Brian Butler went over to him or Darren Muller went over on to him, but Tygo Dwyer was kind of quietened uh, thereafter. And uh, it's just funny with Ballyhale as well. Colin was mentioned, Colin Fenley was mentioned there. Like he was quiet enough at the edge of the square and they're able to bring him out centre forward and he's able to get two points in the second half and they're able to play TJ floating and they can just they can move to pieces whatever way you like. And like when I look at players that Kilkenny need over the next probably decade. I think Dara Corkin is one that that will make a good that will make a good stab at having a right good Kilkenny career over the next while. And he wasn't playing yesterday; wasn't involved. But David Blanchfield is another. They're two big, athletic players, good ball players, good in the air, uh, good pace. They're probably they're the type of player that Kilkenny need in around that half back line midfield going forward. But uh, yeah, Dara Corkin definitely, and obviously his brother Ron as well, who was captain yesterday. Um, they're like. Yeah, there's plenty of players, plenty of players for Derek Ling to work with over the next while. Yeah, going to be really interesting to see what his first team is in the league. And obviously, we'll be we'll be all over it whenever that time comes. Um, let's see a few more comments here. Ballyhill half back line all scores. Tullerone were the team to beat, says Flad. They left a lot of chances of begging in the semi final against Ballyhale. Uh, Butler is pretty underrated too. Uh, ML89, Nap, uh, as in the Pearshake, have only won three games outside of Munster and two of those against the Ultra Champions. Are people overestimating them a bit based on an All Ireland win six years ago? Well, look, as I know only too well, they're an unbelievably tough team to play against, but they've had a bit of a player kind of turnover, like as in they've brought through a couple of different players the last uh, couple of years. I don't think their team would necessarily be the exact same as it was that when we faced them a couple of years ago. It feels like there's been a little bit of turnover there, which could be a good thing or a bad thing. With That remains to be seen. But certainly they have a final coming up against Kilmallock fairly soon after beating South Liberties 123 to, to nine points. So it was, it was never really in danger there. And I suppose didn't really expect it to be in danger, did we? Um, it was tight enough at halftime. It was only eight points to five. And Barry Nash, he did all the scoring for South Liberties. But after that, the likes of, um, I think it was Kevin Downs, he scored eight points. They were all frees. Adrian Breen chipped in with six from play. And it was just too much from uh, over the course of the game. First semi-final in 37 years for South Liberties. And I don't think too many expected them to win. No, it's funny. Like Someone like Adrian Breen, he came on in the 2020 All-Ireland Final. Um, and for injury or otherwise, hasn't featured that much since. Then you have someone like David Dempsey. And then you have, who is the same, great hand, great pace, great finisher. Hasn't featured much in the last couple of years. Kevin Downs is obviously involved in 2018. Hasn't really featured with Limerick since. But they're all brilliant club players. Like, And then you throw Peter Casey, Mike Casey. Um, uh, who else? William O'Donoghue into the mix. Uh, Ronan, uh, Lynch. Ro- Ronan Lynch as well. Like, Jesus, like that's, that, is, that is some pool of players to be pulling from. And I think that's, that's probably why we've seen the Patriots so, so highly. Because obviously they, were, they won in All-Ireland. They were beaten in All-Ireland replay. Um, and there's the potential there. They've kind of been riddled with injuries in recent years. And I think every Hurling fan just wants to see Napier, a fully fit Napiershig and how far can they go. Can they potentially lay it down to Bally Gunner? Can they potentially lay it down to Bally Hale? But they've uh, a massive challenge to overcome before they get there. Now, um, Kilmallock got out of jail. There's no point in saying any different. They really, really got out of jail. Oh. That, Rob, that Robbie Egan goal at the end... Um, and I just, it was amazing. There was a couple of goals at the weekend where, uh, like, a goal was scored despite, like, 20 people being in around the square. And we'll see it here. Look at the conditions here as well. Yeah, it's, you can see the conditions. It's not, that's probably going wide there. Uh, and then the defender on the line probably should have cleared it a bit better. And... Yeah, there's a lot of lads. That's a killer. Didn't, yeah, a lot of lads probably didn't cover themselves in glory there. It's amazing. One good connection by either keep either the keeper, the cornerback, or the wing back when the ball bounces and that ball is dead. So it's just like get the ball out of the danger area. Get, it doesn't matter how just get it out there and get a good ten or fifteen yards of it, get it out of the danger area. But once it's in there, anything can happen and it and it did. Like Kilmanic really got out of jail. There's no point in saying any different than doing it be absolutely heartbroken, a horrible way to lose that game. 
Yeah, Richard Hogan says, really uh, feel sorry for Dune. Hope they can get there soon. Is GG closed or the semi-finals played their Gaelic grounds? I know the final is going to be on there. I'm not entirely sure if there was a problem with the pitch or if they just decided to take it around the grounds. Uh, Dune were seven points up in the second half. Darius Stapleton had scored one goal. Dean Coleman added the other. They looked like they were in shape to go on and just see this game out. Like When it's that low scoring, and to be seven points up when it's that low scoring, it really does kind of suggest maybe there's a little bit of white line fever combined with individual mistakes, maybe even a small bit of bad luck there. But, you know, we were, you were asking the other day, would Conor Hanley-Clark be playing in goals or would he would he be in the forward line like last year when he used to come on? He came on and he was knocking over freeze in the forward line. That was very important because he was, like Mike Hoolan had been on target with a few, but he came on and took them over. It says an awful lot when he's taken over on the freeze. Um, but it sets up that first final um between the Pearshig and Kilmallock since 2017, which is kind of surprising when hasn't it been like up until this year, been the same four teams that got to the semi finals five years in a row. So, first time since 2017, and between them, they've won 10 of the last 12 Limerick titles. So, that'll be 11 of 13 pretty soon. But that's as tasty a county final as there's going to be. That's very tasty. I'd still have the Pearshig as fairly red hot favourites going into it, and the Kilmallock, Kilmallock won't mind that because the well were heavy favourites going into last year's final, and they won that game well. But Kilmallock haven't really delivered yet this year, but they're still there. Um, conditions will probably tell a lot as well. Um, you know, if it's a if it's a grand dry day like I'm looking outside here in County Mead at the moment, I think the Pearshig will win. Um, if it's that sort of a dour type of a game. Um, it definitely evens the odds in Kilmallock's favour, but I'd, I'd be, yeah, I'd be pretty strong on the Pearshig at this juncture anyway. But I think that's two weeks away, um, and that's most of the county finals will be played at that stage. So that'll be the marquee game probably that Sunday, and it is a serious marquee game. They like go down through, go down through. We've you know there's eight to nine players on the Kilmallock side that have been in around uh, Limerick squad as we said last Thursday, and it's the same from the Pearshig side. Um, I'd imagine the Pearshig are fairly hurt over. Um, over last year in particular and the amount of lads that were missing obviously uh, Mike Casey was out Peter Casey was out with a couple of more injuries as well um, so that's going to be a fascinating final to look forward to in two weeks time yeah is it, is it we're probably not totally shocked that Dunloy got the job done in the in the final yeah. of the Anthem uh, yeah 120 to 211 against Rory O'Cushendall and Cushendall started really well I think it was like 20 seconds in and Neil McManus had buried one into the back of the net Um and they were 1-2 to a point up, but I think maybe 20 minutes in, Dunloy, who were just such an athletic team, and I think that stood to them, and they started to pop over the points, and Cushendall were struggling to win ball. And they got that second goal, which maybe somewhat masked the dominance of Dunloy. And then later on, I think the, the Elliots really stood up for Dunloy, and um, I think they got that goal. And just double-check who scored it. It was uh, Chrissy McMahon scored the goal, and I think it just allowed them to kick on. Nigel and Shan Elliott scoring points later on. But Keelan Malloy, three points again. Like I feel like he's been a star man in, the, in these county finals in Antrim in the last couple of years. Yeah, he's a big he's a big game player as well, isn't he? Because there's always going to be a bit more pressure on him. And he's probably going to be a marked man going into the games. But he was brilliant in last year's final. I remember him getting a goal. I think that game was televised last year. And he was obviously good at the weekend as well. Conal Cunning, like at this time of the year, Shane, the value of having a guy who's going to put over 90% of place balls. Is By the way, it was it was Neil McManus had the shot and Cormac McLafferty, he swept the ball into the net. Sorry, just to clarify. Yeah, but, but just the, the value of having a, you know, it's a, it's a bit of a heavier ball, conditions are tough, it's hard harder to get a score from play at this time of the year. Having somebody that, when he puts down the ball, you can nearly turn away and when you look back at the scoreboard in 15 seconds, there's going to be another one onto your tally is huge and Cunning's accuracy from place balls was huge again. And as I said it a couple of weeks ago, They'll be absolutely gunning for a crack at Schlock Neil and will feel that there's very little between the two of them. Um, and while while Schlock Neil had all the experience, maybe up until um, Schlock Neil have had all the experience of playing All Ireland semi finals, and maybe that little edge over Dunloy in recent years, I think Dunloy will fancy their chances of closing that gap and potentially overturning them. So that, that's going to be a, that's going to be a cracker of a game uh, whenever they meet in Ulster. Yeah, and I wonder how much Hurland and Schlock Neil, who who will who they meet in the Ulster Championship, I think they're due to meet them, or certainly they're on a collision course at some point. How much Hurland they've been able to do at the moment because they've had that county semi final in football, they've a county final against Glen coming up, 
Then there is it the down champions that might be facing first in oh, Ulster. Yeah. yeah, so we'll we'll see how that goes. Like I wonder, um, I'd say I'd say the Hearns are probably put to one side because at the moment, because like I'm sure they're I'm sure they're after being beaten or they're after the Glen winning last year, like all eyes will be on the football until the football the county title is over or in their in the bag and they can move on then and focus probably switches back to Hurling. But I'd say there's not too much Hurling being done at the moment. Yeah, uh, Limerick away to Waterford in the Championship next year. Exciting start, says Jack Hartnett. I presume he's talking about the Intercounty. Pa Mar, Ale Le Bleu, hashtag bars. ML89, Dooner a mystery, in danger of a golden generation passing them by. Even the one time they got over a semi final hump, they took an awful pasting, similar to Clonlara, uh, Turlock Moore type club. Now there was there was mitigating circumstances that wasn't Darrow Donovan missing for that county final. That they, I think they had a couple Barry of Murphy as well, was he? Yeah, they had a couple of there was definitely mitigating circumstances going into that final, and they were coming up against they played in the Pierce in their pomp, I think, in that final, didn't they? I think they conceded four or five goals the same day. So I and I, I think they put everything into getting over the line in the semi final, including a couple of injured players probably playing through the pain barrier and then couldn't play for the final. But um yeah, geez, I hope like they've all the talent. I hope I hope they, they get in around the county final again and get a chance to get a chance to win one. But you see how competitive Limerick is, is that you know can't be can't be guaranteed that that's gonna happen. Yeah, I wouldn't say that they took an awful pace in that final. I just double checked the scoreline, two twenty two to three ten. Now maybe they got scores towards the end to sort of bring it back a little bit. I don't really remember the ins and outs of the game, but No, they were they were they were a fair whack behind the hallway to my, to yeah, to my yeah. knowledge. Okay, fine. Give them no hop at all there. <laughs> That's grand. Uh, we're down to the final. By the way, actually, just seeing as uh, one of our commenters there, Jack Hart, mentioned the draw for next year's championship. Is it something whereby you were that concerned about looking at the draw when it came out on Saturday where you were like, I mean, to be honest, it didn't set the pulse racing in any way and now because we're in the middle of October. These games aren't till next summer. Generally, they're fixtures that we've seen time and time again. Like, I mean, even in the hurling, you kind of know what way it's going to be anyway, within reason. And in the football, you're just largely seeing fixtures that you've seen time and time again, whether it's in preseason competitions, qualifiers, or those specific championships. So it does very little to whet the appetite. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't have paid too much attention to it. But um, depending on the draw, like, I think is it either Sligo, Leitrim, or London will be in the All Ireland Championship? There is uh, that, yeah. You know, which is. Oh, that's that seems a bit mad given their league standings. It's like listen, potentially it's a great opportunity for them, but it does it's it's it called, potentially it's, hurt the football championship next summer. Yeah, like the provincial championships are a bit all over the place now. And you are like imagine to say for somebody to get to a Leinster final, particularly if you're playing a preliminary game, you're gonna to have to win three tough games to get to a final to play the dubs, uh, and potentially we'll get through to the All Ireland Championship, whereas in Connacht it's completely different. Obviously, a monster. It's different as it's different as well. So many, so much more, less games and less obstacles to overcome. Um, I did, it's listen. It's only a matter of time before the provincial championship has probably less weight. But uh, I wouldn't have paid too much attention to it uh, realistically, even though it does have ramifications for, as you say, what the competitiveness of the All Ireland Championship could be down the line and the potential for, um, you know. All those games should be really competitive and there's potential for a possible bogey to be in there and for you not to be looking forward to a big championship game. Yeah. And that's like not the way, what we want. I mean, the teams you mentioned in Connacht there, again, we're not trying to do any of them down. No, not at all. We are trying to be realistic, of course. One of those could get through. And let's say Cork or, you know, for example, Derry, who got to an All-Ireland semi-final last year, if they get relegated from Division 2 and they go down to Division 3, then you might not see one of those two teams who's, you know, regularly or, you know, at least occasionally gone fairly far in the championship not being there and a team that is going to face a heavy beating at some stage, you would imagine, being there. So, yeah, I don't know. I, and I certainly wasn't blown away by the draw. But anyway, look, that's that's uh, we'll be chatting about that as we get closer to the championship. The preliminary quarterfinals in... Um, in Galway were very interesting. So Portumna, they played Crockwell. It was 2-10 to 13 points to, to Portumna at the end of the game. So they're into a quarterfinal now, despite getting relegated in recent times. They're back in the, in the discussion. I think Joe Canning played well and Jack Canning also, I, I believe, at wing back. Yeah, Joe got a great goal. Now he got away with he got away with a fair amount of steps along the way now. But, and uh, that's, that's the reputation thing, it's, as in like... Not everyone's getting away with that. 100%. I totally agree with you, sure. There was years there where DJ got away with 12 or 13 steps. They, like, that's just, that's the, that's the way of the world. Um, particularly with a big man like that as well. 
he's probably taken more steps than you realise, I would say. But it was an unbelievable finish. And uh, I just actually saw on Buff's kind of Snapchat thing there, you could see how much like he was loving it at the end. Because um, while he maybe downplayed Portumna being relegated to Senior B and its significance, he would like he's used to winning club all Ireland with Portumna and going on big runs and like that would that would have hurt and you could see how much it meant to him after the game and by all accounts Jack Canning was brilliant at wing back uh, as well for them so and I know I think Henry was there uh, in the stand looking at it um so maybe he's potentially maybe a player that they could look at I know he was in around the squad under Shane O'Neill but I don't know if he made a championship squad. But uh, he's probably coming into his, his prime as well. So it'll be interesting to see if he's looked at. But it was a big win for them. Crock Crowell were obviously in a county semi-final last year. Portumna were, were nowhere last year. And we kind of said as well, you kind of questioned whether, you know, if they came up against one of those A teams, how would they go? Or if they were playing A teams the whole way through, how would they go? Like they, they, they pulled off a big result there the other day in, in pretty horrible conditions. Um, and it's funny, that Galway Championship... Um, it's probably the championship I get most excited about when it's not when it can still be in the early stages because there's a, maybe outside of Thomas's there's a lot of teams at a similar enough level like these prelim quarterfinals are really good uh, the bits and pieces I heard from them as well Capitagal had a good win over Mike Cullen uh, it finished seventeen points to ten they've been in around uh, they've been in around plenty of semi-finals and quarterfinals in recent years that ends the the Mike Cullen double dreams, but they've still had a great year. Um, Claren Bridge last year's county finals had a good win over Ardrahan as well. They'd be kind of neighbouring clubs as well. So that was a brilliant win there. Keen Salmon, I think, got the goal. Um, and Ardrahan, I believe, could have got one back through Irla Tanyan, who's like 10 years on since he got the, the man of the match in the drawn uh, All Ireland final, one that's regularly forgotten about if you were to ask if you were to ask people who got it. But um our, our Claren Bridge staying going there and Turlock Moore had a good win over Ormore Marie as well 213 to 11 points Dottie Burke very very good at centre back apparently but uh, I don't know if you have the quarter final draw there to hand but there's some really tasty games in the, in the quarter final and the Thomases have been beaten already beaten by Turlock Moore and they'll I think they're playing is I think they're playing Capitagal in that in the quarter yeah. final as well so some tasty games ahead yeah, Sarsfields also against Portumna, Tommy Larkins, Claren Bridge, and Loch Rail meet Turlock Moore. Uh, I'm going to give a bit more detail on the games from the weekend in Galway, but just seeing as you mentioned it there, and Neil Latanian getting man of the match in the 2012 final, more people would remember the fact that uh, Wally Walsh got it in the replay. In 2013, man of the match, it was it was Shane O'Donnell, wasn't it, in the replay? And yep. uh, it must have been because he got 3 3. And the man of the match in the 2014 replay was Kieran Joyce, I think, wasn't it? Yeah, because it was all guys who hadn't started the first day. That was the thing. So it will be a fair old quiz, and maybe we'll throw it out to people here because I don't think I can remember off the top of my head. As well as Irlitanian in 2012, who won the man of the match in the drawn All Ireland final in 2013, and in the drawn All Ireland in 2014? That's a fair question. If anyone's got the answers um, out there, I, I could be wrong. Uh, I think Podge got it in 13. And the reason why he didn't get hurled of the year was because he played so well in the drawing game and Cork switched Brian Murphy over to him off Tony Kelly, who had a good replay. Uh, I think that... What was the other one you asked? Did you ask another question? 14 as well. Who won it in 14? So I... Oh, well, I tip kill Kenny. Genie, yeah. man. You kind of forget about it with, with, the, with the Bubbles Hawkeye. You totally forget. You as well, in the 2015 All-Ireland football final replay, Mick Fitzsimons got man of the match. So that meant Wally, uh, Shane O'Donnell, Kieran Joyce, and Mick Fitzsimons all got man to match in All Ireland Fine Replay, having not started the drawn game. Yeah, which is it was an incredible run. Yeah, yeah, and nuts. it just showed that if a manager looks beyond his first fifteen and changes it up a little bit, he can get huge rewards from it, as he did there. Colin Ryan, the first day in twenty thirteen, was it okay? Well, if that if if that, he definitely should have got an All Star in thirteen, and that would highlight that would highlight it even further. Like it was a bit mad that he didn't get an All Star in thirteen. <laughs> Actually, John O'Sullivan might be right about Richie Hogan because I think he scored maybe six the first day against Tip and had a quiet replay but still got hurler of the year. I was going to say he got four and got two in the replay, but I could, but I could be wrong. He definitely had a very good uh, drawn All-Ireland final yeah, in that real high-scoring game. I think Callanan got six in the drawn one, got a couple of goals in the in the replay. Uh, I always Corbin. find it peculiar, Shane, that um, I love JJ Delaney. I think he's the best. You don't say it. 
the best defender that ever played the game. But Callan got a fair whack of scores off him in the drawing game in 14 and in the replay. Now, 262 and, and games. All that's remembered is the hook. It's funny. Uh, the winners do write the script. I have to say they definitely do. And I think Bubbles got five or six from play the first day as well, which was quite something. Uh, yeah, James Ernie says... Most of them off Jackie, I think, yeah. I was at Dune Kilmalik yesterday. Horrendous conditions. Dune will be sick after being seven points up. It was some battle. No fancy hurling, that's for sure. It was dog eat dog. I got saturated, but well worth it. So I'm just going to go through some of those Galway games again, the preliminary quarterfinals to give a little bit more detail. So in Port Humna's win over Crockwell, uh, I think holding them to holding Crockwell to four points in the second half was a huge part of this. Obviously, dreadful conditions. Uh, Port Humna have won every game in Senior B this year, and they'll play uh, Sarsfields, as we said, It'd be a bit of a shock to nothing because Sarsfields are such heavy favourites and uh, a long way to go after just a couple of years ago being beaten by St. Thomas's 4.28 to 15. Uh, but there's some good young players like Declan McLaughlin really shining from there. Uh, like you mentioned, Mike Cullen losing to Cappy there is probably always going to be um, a tough one there, bridge too far. But they've had a great year. They'll be senior A next year. And Cappy have reached the quarterfinal now every year since 2018. And uh, let's see, um, big threats would be Liam Collins and Ja Mannion, as I said, there against uh, Thomas's now. Claren Bridge and Ardrahan, that was, as you said, South Galway neighbours there, and a closer game than probably the seven point margin suggested. And then obviously, Turlock Moore, a very comfortable win over Owen Moore Murray. You want to look at some of the, the comments there? Yeah, no, Joe, Joe Butler just said Richie got it in the 14 first game. That, that sounds about right, but it's just funny how you forget. Um, there's certain things, weird things kind of hurling that you forget. Ones that I'd always throw out are, um, you know, even forgotten all stars. The all star season is coming up. You know, a lot of people will forget that Eamon Kennedy was the centre back all star in 2000 for Kilkenny, and he was uh, he was poor in the All Ireland semi final in 2021 or 20, 2001, and Cody never picked him again thereafter. He never played for Kilkenny in Championship after. Uh, Derek Hardiman, wing back in, in 2005, would be another one. Brian Murray in goals in 2007. And then when you look at some of the players that haven't got all stars, maybe Shane O'Donnell will uh, rectify that this year. Like Sir Connor Fogarty as well. There's been some good players that haven't got all stars, and then maybe some surprise players that you'd maybe forget. Um, and then others who got it just uh, by dint of their name and reputation. Expand on it. You know as well as I do that there are some players out there who had an all star or two, had a big name, and then the following season they might have an okay season. And a less fashionable name definitely played better and didn't get the all star. The big name got it. Oh, 100%. I just wanted to just expand on it. Yeah, no, I 100%. You were looking it. for me to name names there, and I wasn't <laughs> going to go down that road. I've made um, enough enemies. But uh, no, I 100% agree. And because it's it's a big departure to pick a name maybe that is less fashionable, shall we say. Like, I, I think Cotton Malone was very close to being an all star a couple of times. And Maybe but because he's not, he's not a flashy name, it's easy to not pick him, I suppose. And I'm not saying that that's what happened, but I'm just saying it feels like over the years that type of thing has happened somewhere along the line. Well, I always feel like even when I... I remember I didn't make a, a fresher squad in UL one time, and it was, you know, just, it was partly because it was useless, partly because I'm not flashy. <laughs> yeah. But uh, the names, I just I just remember the squad, and it was all... Who, who was picked ahead of you? Who was picked ahead of you? Oh, I couldn't tell you. Uh, not not lads that were better than me anyway, I can tell you that. Yeah, well, well that went without saying. No, if you had to start naming some of your favourites, like JJ Delaney, who obviously was Waterford, and take your pick, really, you'd have still said you were done. I uh, know. This is an interesting one of John O'Sullivan comes out, and I'm a big, big fan of this now. So Sean Phil will probably get an all star over Mikey Butler, even though Butler had the better year. Um, I'd, I'd be say they both will. As cornerbacks? Yeah, two cornerbacks. How about Barry Nash? I think he could end up as the... Uh, I'm not saying he shouldn't. I'm just saying I think he they will. Because these will be votes across the board, won't they, from different counties, players uh, voting on it. No, no, it's the journalists. Journalists are voting. Oh, sorry, it's the hundred of the year that's yeah. the vote, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, so, like, to me, Mikey Butler should be in cornerback before Sean Finn. I think Sean Finn's deadly, but I think Mikey Butler had a better year. Um, But what... Either Mikey Butler will be left out and he'll get young hurler of the year as compensation, uh, voted, uh, by the, voted by the players, or... He potentially could be out wing back because he followed someone or something like that. But to me, he's the best out and out corner. He was the best out and out cornerback this year. Not picked on reputations, picked on performances in 2022. Would you say the job for the likes of uh, Mikey Butler with Kilkenny is harder than the job that Sean Finn has? That's not to say we don't rate him. We obviously think he's 
well, he's the best cornerback in the game. Yeah. But his job is generally that bit easier because you're a bit more well protected as a as a defender in the Limerick team than you are in maybe the Kilkenny team. Oh, I totally buy that. Yeah, Sean Finn is unbelievably well protected, whereas. Uh, Mikey Butler was going out following lads at different stages. Then he was in playing corner back with where there could be, you know, probably not as good of a defensive structure in front of him. So, yeah, like, I'm not that smart. No matter what way you look at it, to me, Butler had a better year. That's not to say, now, what you're saying is, is that Sean Finn is the best corner back in the country, which he is. But he shouldn't be selected as the best cor- the best cornerback in 2022 just because overall he's the best in the game, if you get me. Mikey Butler had a better season. But that I look at that closely. I think that's going to be fascinating. Yeah, Pure Hatchet says Nash and Butler deserve it. Finn, not a hope this year, but we'll get one. The Armagh final this year, Middletown Nafina beat Cade, uh, Cade Jalov, Jarek, 119-212. Conor Renahan struck an early goal for Keady there, but Middletown responded to lead 11 points to 1-7 at the break. After the restart, Sean Colton struck a second goal for Keady, uh, but Middletown remained composed, uh, Keady being Cade Lava, Jarek, and uh, Ryan Gaffney replied to the major for Middletown and laid on four points in the spin uh, from Dean Gaffney, Nathan Curry, Ben Toll, and Cahill Carvel ensured Middletown uh, retained the title there. The junior final was won by Sean Tracy's uh, Cavan, the Tom Walsh Senior Hurling Championship, uh, Coot Hill beat East Cavan Gales, 116-10. to in Derry, the, the leading timber frame Derry Intermediate Hurling Championship final was won by Owen Rua against Ballinus Green. Actually, we were just talking about this beforehand. There's some interesting sponsor names to championships. We talked about the Michael Murphy sports one before, but one that really stood out to me as being an unusual name for a sponsor of a county championship is the Peter Carty Funeral Director for Manor Junior Football Championship final. I think that's an interesting one. There's some good ones out there. There's another one in Wexford, which is the Whizzy Internet. Wexford Intermediate A Football Championship. Comments, get your comments in there and let us know what's the best sponsor name going with the county championship. I'm sure that our, our good, uh, our great viewers who have their boots on the ground um, will have some absolute doozies there for us. But it's just the funeral directors now is like pff, fair play to them for sponsoring it. But I don't know if it's. I, I don't know. I think you have to you have to be clever about some what you're putting, what sponsorship you're putting with uh, a county championship. Like I'm not sure if having a funeral director is yeah. the best, one, but you'll take finances any way you can get them. I to, I totally agree with you there. Um, but you wouldn't have a, like a funeral director on the name of a GA grounds. So I don't think you would. I don't think you could do that now. If the money's there. It's, it's all about yeah, the the bunts, bunts and burner. Nice little Just learner. A, a couple of quick, uh, other quick uh, games that we just kind of skipped over there. So in Galway, I think the Galway Intermediate and Junior Finals were on this weekend. They were indeed. The Junior A Final was won by Ballygar, uh, 117 uh, against Scahan and Mount Belly My Lot, 116. That sounded like an absolute epic. In the relegation, senior relegation game, a Hasker phone, I uh, stayed up. They beat Tina Abbey Denairi, 113 to 112. And I believe the conditions were absolutely atrocious there. I think Shane Maloney had a couple of frees to level it up for Tina, but very, very difficult to score anything in these conditions. So a Hasker phone, I led by the Mannions, uh, stay up. And in the intermediate hurling final in Galway, Kilimer beat uh, Milik Aircourt 13 points to nine. There were a couple of, one other result they wanted to read out as well was the Offaly Junior Hurling Championship final. Eden Derry, uh, better known as a football club traditionally, had a 314 to 113 win over Balnamir. And uh, a great little story out of this. With a combined age of 96, Sean Og Farrell and Killian Farrell came off the bench in the closing stages to guide Eden Derry to a first Offaly Junior Hurling title in 24 years. Um, Sean Og uh, Farrell is 51 at Christmas. He was on the Offaly panel in 1994, and Killian Farrell is 45. So we talked about a lot of guys doing it at uh, you know a big age, but 50 is a fair age to still be going strong and win the county title. Sean Oak Farrell and 45 for Killian. So fair play to them. What about this? Nicky Green lined out for the Bally Brick and Junior Hurlers um, and managed to score and assist at the age of 64. <laughs> Surely in contention for performance of the weekend. That's not bad going at all. Put the goat up in front of him there. That's some going. Fair play. And I, I will, I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can combine the goat with it. All yeah, now. Because I think the goat will actually come in and you might still be able to see him on the screen, I'd say. There you go. There's the man. Um, fair play. And it, like lads like that are the absolute heartbeat of clubs. Like I'm sure they were stuck for numbers. He said he's always he'll always have the gear, he'll always have a hurl ready. Would you mind coming in or whatever? You've been in involved in teams, Shane, where you know you're scrambling for numbers and it's like 
you know, will you play if you have to? You know, and you mightn't have played in five years or whatever. And someone will play. They'll all, like the vast, vast majority of the time, they'll always play and they'll help out the cause. And 64 years young, fair play to them. Yeah, I remember being a young lad and I was showing up to watch a Bursley challenge match out in Money Gall. And I had a bag of sweets in my hand as I was walking in, probably beside one of the parents. And I was eating sweets away. A few minutes later, I was talking. And I was in there. <laughs> so these things happen. Stage! Um, <laughs> so um, a story this weekend that uh, Liz Moore is James O'Connor, who was over Bally Gunner, or Bally Hale last year, has been recommended as the new Watford minor hurling manager and will be announced at the end of the month, uh, joined by Gavin O'Brien of Rowan Moore and Seamus Hannon from Bally Duff Upper. So that'll be, that'll be an interesting progression for him. And I wonder, is it with a view in the long run, maybe getting a run at the county job? Yeah, um, anytime I ever talk to James or Joxer, as he's called, I was very impressed by him. Seriously, passionate hurling man, as a good, uh, as a good pedigree, even on the, the club scene within Cork as well. It's obviously very unlucky not to be an All Ireland club winner manager. And just yeah. when you talk about the the journey of Bally Hale, and you mentioned it last Thursday, like to have won five in a row with three different managers, and for everything just to keep seamlessly moving along is fair going. Started with Henry, obviously moved on to James O'Connor and then moved on to Pat Hoban and Jimmy Marr uh, this year. It's, it's phenomenal, really. But uh, James O'Connor has a serious um, has a serious pedigree. He was over this more before, a uh, teak tough defender back in his own days. And I'm sure he'd like to... This is probably the start of maybe potentially getting on the inter-county ladder. Yeah. So we're going to talk a bit about, uh, I should say, Kilmacud Croaks. They're probably... They're what is it now? Six days out from potentially doing a, a double in Dublin which would be the hurlers beating Nafina after the footballers beating Nafina. And I suppose you saw the video of Shane Walsh being brought into the into the back into the clubhouse last night, being thrown up on someone's shoulders and all. Like he was brilliant for Crokes. I think he finished up with four points, all from play. Other players chipped in. Darren Mullen got a couple, Craig Diaz got a couple, and then Rory O'Carroll, Andrew McGowan, and Ben Shovlin got one each. But they were pushed to the pin of their collars. But Jesus Christ, I'd imagine in Nafina they're just they're just pretty sick at this. They were in a good position. And then one of the best footballers in the country just he do, does what he does, you know, and came in, obviously took a, a shot around the head. And I think he was in an ambulance for a few minutes and eventually came back in and uh, just made the difference. Yeah, uh, he made a massive difference. But unfortunately for Nafina, they shot themselves in the foot a bit as well. Like their, their accuracy or lack thereof in front of the post was a bit of a killer because they could have just had a small bit of a buffer potentially and they just couldn't get the ball over the bar in the last, what was it? I think, were they, were they the last 24 minutes without scoring. Am I right in saying that? Yeah. Um, and that's just, you're, you're just not going to win a county final hanging on. How many teams win games hanging on? You just, you don't. You, you just needed to keep things ticking over. And unfortunately, uh, they weren't able to. And just Shane Walsh's class. Here we are, yeah. One of their own. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, and he's probably looking around there and... I mean, I would say this from the first time we won a county title with Kula, like as someone from the outset, a lot of times you do, you're not even sure who some of the people are around the place and you are celebrating with them. But he's probably looking around there and he's only in the club a few months. And he may not even know who half of them are. Yeah, it's gas, isn't it? Yeah, it's gas, yeah. yeah. He'll, he'll, have a fair idea. he'll have a fair idea who they all are over the next couple of days. It's uh, when, he's having, he can remember. Uh, uh, when he's having pints of the black stuff been put, thrown down in front of him from everyone and anybody in Kilmaco Crocs. Is, if you got a pint off every member in Kilmaco Crocs, you'd be sorted for the rest of your life, I'd say. By God, you'd be in bits for years to come. But fair play. It looks like it was great crack there. Uh, but ah, Nafina, yeah, I think... the. Like the female want to make sure that they don't do the double over them next weekend. Yeah, and the uh, the ladies footballers beat Dunboyne in the in the Leinster Ladies Football Championship yesterday, so they're going for the treble. Were were their ladies beaten in the Camogie final by Vincent's as well? I'm not. I'm not. I can't Vincent remember. Anyway, yeah. yeah. Um, but they're obviously going for the the treble and the double double. So it, the treble in one year and then the double double over over two years would be fair going. Yeah, yeah. So uh, impressive stuff from Shane Walsh and from Kilmacud. They're they're just like a really, really difficult team to stop. Great to see yeah, John O'Sullivan with a, a fairly tongue in cheek comment, I would imagine. A yeah, great great to see Paul Flynn like Kilmacud doing well. Ah, uh, listen, um, it's mad. The pressure was on Shane Walsh to deliver coming in for Kilmacud, and you know he had a tough time probably against Kula. Well, by God, did he deliver in spades when when he was needed most. And I'm sure, like, the fight, this final could have went a completely different way, you know, if he wasn't able to come back out into the field. If he'd gotten the knock at a different stage and it wasn't just before half time, 
as well. If he got in it, you know, at the early stage of the second half, he's off for 10 or 15 minutes. But the fact the timing of it actually helped him and meant that he was able to get patched up or whatever, because I think he needed stitches in his ear. Um, yeah, there won't be, you know, it's not that exactly having strapping on your head is not exactly how you want to celebrate a county final and probably not being able to hear exactly what's going on, but uh, I'm sure he'll take it. Yeah, so uh, we'll move on to the Kerry Championship there if you want to lead us into it. Yeah, surely will. Obviously, there was uh, plenty of drama in the Kerry Championship over the weekend as well. Not too much drama on Saturday night, but a lot of drama yesterday. On Saturday night, Mid Kerry had a good win over Field Rangers, uh, 15 points to nine. Uh, and they're going to play East Kerry in the final. East Kerry overcame Dingle, 1-9 to 1-8. Can, can you bring up the video of this clutch score from Paul Murphy? Like, what a clutch score. Outside of the right boot, just serious gumption to take on this kind of a score at such a crucial time. And I know he had a bit of a breeze at, 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 behind him. Paul Murphy, a serious, serious score. Is it a bit of a right-footed Kevin Cassidy victory. 2011 against uh, mm-hmm. Donegal? He's got every chance. Not far off, yeah. It's not far off, yeah. Uh, brilliant score. Look at the conditions. You can the see Kerry's the rain absolutely bucking down. down. And like that's twice now. East Kerry had been put to the pin or the collar a couple of times, but they found an answer. I thought the big performance would come uh, yesterday. I think there's a big, big final performance brewing, I have to say. But that was, you know, fair, fair play to Dingle. They really, really threw it down to them. Obviously, with Mark O'Connor and Thomas Sullivan and, and Paul Ganey and Todd, they'll be hugely disappointed to have just come out on the wrong side of that. You know well it's not Tom O'Sullivan, it's Tom Sullivan. That's <laughs> sorry, the way yeah, I like yeah. yeah. Like yeah, really the old the old, the old does not exist. Yeah, just looking at that team that East Kerry have, like Ronan Buckley's a player we'll be hearing a lot more about, as is Rory Murphy, but then Paddy Clifford as well established at this stage. David Clifford, who was kept to just a point from a free, I believe. Uh Dara Roach has looked really good anytime I've seen him. A former footballer of the year in James O'Donoghue. I mean, there's so much class in that team. Jonathan Lyon, who's won an All-Ireland title. Paul Murphy, who we've already talked about. What a team they have there. And, uh, yeah, it's unfortunate for Dingle. I mean, did excellent performance overall. Paul Ganey scored four points, one of those being from a mark. It's just, it's very hard to see East Kerry being beat. Like, mid Kerry were very good against Field Rangers, 15 points to nine. Um, but, geez, it's, isn't it going to be very hard to see East Kerry beat? I uh, know it is, yeah. Now, I'm looking at it from one point of view in the sense that I think East Kerry are going to explode in the county final and deliver a big display. But they've probably stuttered so far. They really, really have. They, um, they haven't been at the top of their game. But um, I, ju- I just sense a big final performance coming. But in fairness, um, they're going to be overwhelming favourites going into the final. So maybe maybe, maybe an upset is on the cards. This is, this is an unbelievable score from uh, was it Jack O'Connor. Uh, I think it was, yeah. Like, look at the little... That's a David Clifford-esque touch to take the ball away, isn't it? Like the, the one against Monaghan. A couple, or is it Monaghan or Galway a couple of years ago in the uh, league? Galway, I thought. Yeah, look at that. Like, what a beautiful yeah. little flick across. Great score. He, he won't be wearing number 17 for too long if he keeps producing that sort of stuff there. So, big win there. It's going to be mid Kerry against East Kerry in the final. Uh, in Mayo, Balna, Stephen Knight beat Ballantubber 3-10 to 113. And Westport, they needed late heroics against Castlebar Mitchells to win by 111 to 110. And again, it was a it was a dirty old score. Shane Scott got it for a finish. Or actually, maybe it was um maybe it was a great finish and for a finish. I'm just gonna get it up here. We'll have no, it was there. actually a good finish. Um, he's a big left footer and he threw a sidestep. Um, which he's obviously his left foot is a strong foot. Look at the little sidestep here. But Shane, if you look at it, if you look at it very closely. Paddy Durkin was involved in the play before this and slips here. Just one second. He slips there. Yeah. It's so unlucky from his point of view because it allowed um, it allowed it allowed Scott to turn back onto his left. Whereas if Durkin was standing, he wouldn't he would he could have turned to his left, but there was nowhere to go. So it was very, very unlucky. But um I don't know what I don't know. Does it look like Westport's name is written on the, the Mayo trophy already? To survive two red cards the last day. Pulled a bit of a Houdini act yesterday, uh, but they're going to get lots of it in uh, in the Mayo County final. I was only thinking as well, Shane, is there a, a Balnar in the county final, obviously, but is there a more likeable player in the country than Parik O'Hora? I just think he's a hugely likeable player. I think he's unbelievably honest. I just love the fact he's unbelievably, um, he's his own man, shall I say, as but well. But didn't he get a huge slating after the league final against Kerry last year? Yeah, by who? I know, but I, I just felt like he was getting a big slating from people. Maybe maybe people from Dublin, because you know the way Dublin supporters don't seem to think that Mayo are the greatest thing since sliced bread. But 
I think he's very likable. I had him on the show before and I thought he was brilliant. But I don't feel like he's loved across the board by every county. Uh, maybe maybe it's just maybe it's just within Mayo then. I just think he's a hugely hugely likable fella. He was obviously in the he's in Ultima Hell Week there last year, the year before as well. Uh, I just and he, he obviously it took him a while to make his breakthrough with Mayo and I don't know, the long hair and even his ponytail been pulled back the last year. I just think he's a hugely likable fella. And uh I'd have no issue with, you know, running into David Clifford in the league final or, you know, talking or whatever. I think Clifford was talking to him or admitted that he was talking to him or he ran into him nearly first as well. So I'd have I'd have no issue with him at all. But uh Gerardo Gracon Ogo Gracon says Lee Keegan is the most likable player in the country. He's I thought huge, that's who you yeah. were gonna say actually. No, no, no I, well like here there there we go. The two of the most likable players in my opinion in the country coming up against each other in the Mayo County final and they're both defenders. Um defender are defenders more likable than forwards? Well, I find David Clifford pretty likable the way he kicks that ball. And the fact that he plays snooker as well and loves snooker as well is a big deal too. Like yeah. Even though know. even though you in your madness said the snooker wasn't a game. We have a we No have no, a I said it is a game, you said it's a sport. I'm sorry. No, it is a sport, one hundred percent. Listen, we're gonna we're gonna decide it anyway. I think me and you are gonna have a little charity game at some stage in, in uh in November. More details to be announced soon. Yeah, I mean, the details being that we're thinking of doing it as a Movember thing and sort of collecting for charity and maybe having a bit of a charity game at the end of it, try and live stream it, all that kind of crack. What would people think of that? Um, this hasn't been discussed, so I'm going to throw it out here. Uh, loser uh, shaves his head. No, no, <laughs> no, no. I have too much to lose there. <laughs> too much to lose. What do you think, folks? Loser How about shaves his head. How about if you lose, you get a proper haircut? <laughs> As in, one that style, maybe an old fade at the side. I don't think so. I don't think that's going to happen anyway. Yeah, but um, sounds like hell to you. Can I just say, the fact that, you, that you've said you, you would absolutely hate getting your head shaved means that that's definitely going to be your forfeit. I wouldn't really mind, so you can come up with some sort of forfeit, some other forfeit for me. A tattoo of a temporary flag on your forehead. Ah, uh, tattoo. No, I won't be getting a tattoo. Sounds like you don't like it. We're I definitely won't be, doing I won't be getting a tattoo anyway. Uh, so also the Connacht, sorry, the um, Mayo relegation final was on, and the nail after extra time they were level with Davids one eight to eleven. The nail won three two on penalties. Imagine the stress of going up taking a penalty, knowing that your senior status is at stake. Yeah. Uh, and like not been smart, the nail have been under pressure this year. Um, and they, I think they've been beaten in every championship game up until this, and they sit like penalties have uh, ultimately saved them. So they'll be absolutely delighted with that. Um, I don't. Tommy Conroy is obviously not back either, so they've saved yeah. Mayo senior football status without their best player, which is some going in fairness to them. They've saved the best for last. Yeah, uh, Niall Hegarty says Grod Hegarty the most liked hurler in the country. Surely, uh, actually. Keen Lynch is surely up there. Um, I don't know. Has Niall been a bit facetious there, is he? Um, because Gerald Hegarty is slated by a lot of people, not not by us. We'd call it as it is, but he's seems to be, uh, you know, focused for a lot of criticism with regards to his tackling or whatever. Um, I would have said most likable hurler. I'd always go with a defender. I can't think of anyone off the top of my head now, but I'd always go with a defender where possible. Yeah, okay. Uh, the Tyrone semi finals were also on Carrick Moore beat Clano and uh, Ergol Kieran. They beat Dromore. So that was 11 points to 10. The Canavans were on song there. It's going to, it's uh, yet again, and we talked about it on Friday, doing back to back still hasn't happened since 05 in Tyrone, and it's not going to happen again this year. It's not going to happen. Um, Rory and Dara Canavan were brilliant, and their cousin, I believe, was brilliant as well. So this is a real, this is a real family affair. Like they're, they're very, like they're all very young, like, um, but they're, Obviously adapting to senior club football, and we've seen Dara adapting to um, we've seen Dara adapting to senior county football as well. But like the bars, it'd be unbelievable for them to get a title on the board. Can't think of offhand when the last time last time Ergil Kieran won a county title was was Peter Canavan still playing, or am I have they won one since? Obviously Peter Hart is involved with them too. Um, and I knew Niall Heffernan was been a bit tongue in cheek. I knew he was about Gerard Hegarty being one of the most liked players in the country. Um, Gerard Ogregracon says that Shane O'Donnell has to be one of the most likable hurlers. Eh, I wouldn't disagree. I wouldn't disagree with that either. Um, but uh, yeah, the Canavans are closing in on a Tyrone senior football title. Where Gil Kieran definitely. Yeah, and do you know that uh, Peter Canavan played for Tyrone before he ever played club for Ergil Kieran? 
I'd well believe it. It's usually only a special talent that you can say something like that about. But, but this was actually because of a, a club dispute. And actually, a few years ago, like, so he didn't play from under 20, under 12 up to minor. He played no championship football. He was quoted a couple of years ago saying there was a split in the club and I was part of the breakaway club that tried to get affiliated with the county board. We weren't successful and tried for nine years. So for nine years, I wouldn't have played championship football uh, as such. So that's quite something, isn't it? That is remarkable. I wasn't, I was aware, um, because I think Mickey Hart was involved in that as well. And I was, I was aware that there was some sort of an issue there. But imagine to say that, you know, one of the best players of all time didn't play championship football during his formative years and still turned out to be <laughs> like one of the best players of all time. It's outrageous, really. Yeah, and like uh, eventually the club was reformed as Ergil Kieran in 1990. Um, and then ultimately, yeah, I think he talked a little bit more and he says, to cut a long story short, under the direction of Cardinal Ophiak, Father Sean Hegarty was appointed a cure to the parish with the remit of getting these people and getting this club sorted. He went to both sides and told us what we all wanted to hear, told us a pack of lies, but got the two sides talking again. And the outcome was that the club was reformed and was called after the parish, Ergil Kieran. So that's something else, isn't it? That is un- outrageous now, in fairness. Um, Fergus Butler says here, the forfeit should be where he wears a tip jersey and Saint an Offaly jersey. I think you've worn an Offaly jersey before. I think. Yeah, right but like, to me, like you're, you're obviously looking up at Tipperary, so that would hurt more than me wearing an Offaly jersey. <laughs> um. We'll have to come up with a good far. I have to say the head shave is something you don't like at all and would really hurt you. Don't be hilarious as well. If you no, shave everything from your neck upwards, that would be brilliant. It's a no for me. <laughs> it's a no <laughs> for me. For me. Even just shaving my face, it's a disaster. Never mind shaving the head on top of it. Christ almighty. This time of year, I'd have to get the fake tan. <laughs> and uh, yeah, John O'Sullivan says uh, beard shave. Yeah, look, if I did it, You'd, uh, you'd be asking me to not appear on the show after that for a while. <laughs> uh, the the Mead final had some serious drama over the weekend. Retote beat Summerhill 12 points to 11. But that's not what everyone was talking about afterwards, was it? No, definitely not. They were talking about a uh, bit of an altercation between the rival managers. Uh, they're calling Ratote Bra- the Brady Bunch. Uh, David Brady was over them, but he had a bit of an altercation with Conor Gillespie, who is Summerhill manager. So I'll just give you a bit of context of it. So... Uh, Brady's rat outside led Gillespie Summerhill by just two points deep into injury time when tempers flared. After a foul under the stand in Navin, Gillespie confronted Brady with the altercation leaving the former Mayo midfielder on the ground momentarily. After consulting with his officials, Cormac Riley sent off both men and when the action resumed, Summerhill manufactured another score to cut the gap to the minimum but rat Oat held on. Uh, it all blew over as quick as it happened and the clash was the major incident in an otherwise forgettable Mead decider that saw Ratot pick up a third Keegan Cup inside four years. But uh, Conor Gillespie just talked about it after and he just said, look, to be honest, I saw our guys reacting to a bit of a late hit and I was running down to tell our guys to get back and play, uh, get back and play and get the play going again. And as I turned around, I got a dunt in the back and at the time I interpreted that David had done to me and to be fair, he hadn't. He was just standing in his position and I turned around into him, but I thought he had dunted me and he reacted to that and I shouldered him to the ground. To be fair, the fault for that lies on my behalf. I misinterpreted the situation and reacted in a poor way and paid the price and cost my team a minute or two of play. So it was an example of poor leadership that was punished. Um, as Buff would say, that was a poor statement by me. Um, he just, he, I obviously, tempers flared. Um and he I reacted. like how he's explained himself, though. I like that oh, yeah. he's taken responsibility, and he hasn't just tried to dismiss it. He put a bit of meat on the bones there, and and I think you know, fair enough. Like he, the moment got away from him, but he took responsibility. I always think like Maya culpa, put your hands up. If you're wrong, you're like if you're wrong, you're wrong. Like you know what I mean. And you, you're wrong a lot. You don't put probably put your hands up enough. But <laughs> no, but you know what I mean. If you're wrong in that instance, like and it, it very you know, probably magnanimous of him. Like, they're after losing. I'm sure he's absolutely good. They've lost the, the last couple of county finals they've been in now, maybe four in total after after yesterday. And he's still able to come out and man up and admit that he was wrong and whatever. So, fair play to him. I think David Brady said after he, um when they played Mead in 96, he never ended up on the ground, but he ended up on the ground 26 years later or whatever when he was on the sideline in the Mead Championship final. Yeah, and Dahi McGowan scored three of the points for his team there. Eamon Wallace and Brian McMahon, they also got three each. Bobby O'Brien, Keen Rogers and Jack Flynn did the score. Owen Frayne did the majority of the damage for Summerhill by scoring four. And look, 
I don't really know why Christopher Connell is bringing this up in the middle of the show, considering it hasn't come up at all. Will Tip will be serious under Cahill? Do you know what? I'm, I'm happy to talk about it, Christopher. Why? Why do you Chris, think so? Christopher left field Conlon. Yeah, you've kind of pulled that in out of nowhere, but I, I'm backing you all the way. I'm definitely backing you all the way. Do people agree with Christopher? Um, so the, the uh, Intermediate Football Championship final Mead was done. Shocklin, 16 points. Delete Bellius Town, 7. And in the Senior Relegation Playoff Final, Central's Town, 4-9. Navin O'Mahony's 3-7. So that's Navin O'Mahony's who... You know, both of these were... Very big, challenging clubs, and even in, in Leinster in recent decades, Navin O'Mahony's are gone down, so that's going to be a desperate blow to them. Should we jump on to the Monaghan Championship? Yeah, final? just just quickly, I, uh, our Navin O'Mahony's, Navin O'Mahony's are the most successful team in Mead football history with twenty titles and the relegated mm-hmm. out intermediate. So, like that was that, as we said on Thursday, a big hitter was going to go down, but the biggest hitter went down, uh, and that's hugely disappointing for. You know, Navin is a big town with a huge population. Um, and they'll have to try and turn things around fairly quickly because we've seen before. Um, we've seen before that you know when you go down, if you don't come back up straight away, you can stay down and end up at that level. So they're going to have to try and bounce back there. Gerardo Gacon just says because Waterford were serious under Cat and some uh, come championship this year. I, I I always think I. I definitely wouldn't be looking at Liam Cal's Waterford tenure based on the last two months. I'd be looking at it on the previous two and a half years before that. And there was some really, really good stuff. And I would be expecting a bit of a bounce from Tip, even if, you know, they're going to be down some big personnel um, uh, before they even start. Yeah. Okay. So the Monaghan final there. So Paul Finley's Bally Bay regain the county title were Scottstown going for a was it a four or five in a row we were saying I think I think it was three in a row but it was their 10th final in a row okay okay but geez and what he's the top scorer for the ninth time in 10 years for them outrageous yeah just read through a couple of the stats there so Paul Finley ends the senior football championship as Bally Bay's top scorer for the ninth time in 10 years and as a county champion 22 years on from his senior debut so just going through his honours here quickly he won a junior football championship medal in 2000 Intermediate in 2001, 2004, 2008. That's interesting. Um, hardly got relegated, or either that or was their second team. And then a senior football championship winner in 2012 and 2022. And you'll do well to name a nicer or sweeter left footer than Paul Finley. Maybe David Clifford aside, maybe the Gooch, maybe Kieran McDonald. Yeah, but well, I'd say I thought he an absolute one of a left Kevin footer. Cassidy. Kevin Cassidy, yeah, Kevin Cassidy. Ah, left or right, Kevin Cassidy. Here's a good one from Joe Butler, actually. He says, what did you do to poor Flash today? Did you ban him? We all miss his comments and opinions. We most certainly did not ban him, but I wonder, was he involved in one of the clubs that were defeated in the Limerick Senior Hurling Championship over the weekend? Uh, maybe, and he's uh, maybe have, enjoying or not enjoying a hangover this morning, maybe. Yeah, yeah, he's definitely quiet. and it's, it's definitely notable. Uh, this morning. Uh, just a reminder, we're brought to you by orgoretro.com. Use the promo code RGAME and you'll get 15% off. And by the way, if you're a big hurling fanatic or an aspiring coach, we're going to have an RGAME coaching clinic in NACE this Friday. Uh, it's going to be brilliant and some huge names of the game are going to be there. So really looking forward to that. And the link is under the video if you're watching on YouTube. Shane, the Orga Retro Retro Wexford jersey from Nicky Racker's time is one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. Um, I think it's on sale soon. It's an absolute beauty with the big white block with the number for the number in the back as well. Absolute peach. Yeah. Oh, Hugh Paddy says, video of 1965 Railway Cup doing the rounds on Twitter. Thoughts on a revival. Look, I wish it was never gone, but I can't see it coming back at this stage. It's class, though, the fact that they've, you know, updated the footage and have it in colour. It's, it's brilliant to look at. It's amazing to think how big of a deal the Railway Cup was and how we've let it die. Um, it's amazing because the, I know for a fact players absolutely love it. And like pl- Players love the opportunity of mingling with lads from other counties and learning from them, whatever. Same with like Fitzgibbon or whatever. So I just think, you know, given a, a nice weekend in the calendar and given adequate, adequate promotion, um, I think it's an absolute no-brainer. That footage is absolutely lovely to watch. It's great to, great to watch it back. Yeah, I was trying to find it there, but unfortunately I couldn't find it uh, in short notice. In the Junior Football Championship final in Monaghan, Clonus won six, Kalani six points there. And then the um, the down final. So 
Kilku 113, Warren Point 15 after extra time. So just a point in it there. Connor Laverty, the first inter county manager, maybe to captain a team to a county uh, title at the same time. There can't be too many others in the conversation. Oh, it's a great question. Um, it's a great question. Vinnie Corey was obviously centre back for for Clon Tibbert. They were beaten in the semi final. It's not something, not something that rings a bell now. I have to say, it's really not something that rings a bell. Um, Would Tony Hanno that... have won a county title with St Vincent's when he yeah. captained? Like he was both captain and manager of Dublin in was it seventy seven or seventy eight? Someone out there com uh, comment will know. I wondered. It's he is St Vincent's, isn't he? Yeah, he's Vinny's. Yeah, yeah, he's Vinny's. Yeah, he could, he could well have had. Um, yeah, I can't, like, I can't think of anybody else offhand. Um, it is, a, it is a peculiar one. It is an unusual one, definitely. Yeah, I'm trying to see what he won over the years, but it's not listed handily here on. Um, yeah, I wish it was listed a little bit more handily here on on his Wikipedia page. And obviously, you can always, you can always believe in Wikipedia. Grain yeah, of salt. what's that? I take it with a grain of salt sometimes, though. Yeah. Um, okay, Kevin Walsh came on for Killannon in the intermediate final when Galway manager. Yeah, I remember that, actually. Was he Galway manager or was he Sligo manager at the time? Maybe he was Galway. Maybe he was right. Would you be in favour of bringing back an intermediate inter-county team for every country, uh, county and play off the same format, be unreal for lesser-known players? As long as it doesn't affect clubs, yeah? Yeah, I don't see um, I don't see why not. It's another competition that's been allowed to, to, to die out. Like Usually the counties that were the best exponents of it were probably Kilkenny and Cork. Uh, Tipperary would have been as well. We were very bad and awfully far, very, very bad. But like, it's essentially a development squad for your senior team, or it's a chance for somebody who's maybe walked away from senior inter county to play at a, to still play a county, but just at a lower grade. Uh, didn't Niall Ginnigan win an intermediate with Clare, having finished up with uh, having finished up with Clare, the Clare seniors? Kieran Carey won an intermediate, yeah, with and uh, he basically said that he was playing fullback and his. He's now uh, son-in-law, Tom Condon, was playing cornerback. And Kieran was at the stage where he didn't really strike the ball anymore. He said he just hand-passed it. So he said he, every ball he got, he hand-passed it to Tom Condon and made him look deadly, his words. And Tom Condon got called in with the Limerick Seniors the year after as a result and went on to have it like a decade-long career uh, with the Limerick Seniors. So like, I think it's a, great, it's, a great idea for, um, it's a great idea for development players and maybe something that could help bridge a bit of a, a, bit of a gap between uh under 20s to senior as well i think it's i think it makes perfect sense and then of course uh sarah carey is managed or is married to tom condon so you know yeah. it's a small world uh let's see grodo go crack on yep gilligan did it in 2011 uh celtic tavern that down ret uh, retro jersey is an all-time best no more strike inside in g8 and crow park and hill 16 filled with black and red flags p.s when was the last time that Vernie got a haircut um, it's not that long ago. I just didn't get too no. much taken. I didn't get too much taken off. But ML eighty nine has has asked a mad question here. Did I ever play a railway cup? By God, railway cup was well above my pay grade. I can tell you that. Uh, well <laughs> above. Well above. Yeah. So bringing stuff for Kiku to win a tenth title in eleven years in down. Ryan Johnson scored one one. Paul Devlin four points. Uh, Michal Rooney three points. Caleb Doherty two. And this is not so long ago. After getting over the All-Ireland and, and obviously players going away for the summer and all that. So they've just about managed to keep the show on the road in time to produce performance for the final. It's the third time that both teams went to extra time or beyond that with penalties in this championship, which shows that they've had to earn it the hard way. In the intermediate final, Savile beat Ross Trevor 112 to 19 and the junior final and down, T. Connacht 113, Dramara 12. In Donegal, now I watched this game, Nave Connell beating St. Eunans. The red card was... It was as harsh as they come. You say that again. Um, it was very harsh, and I know one of the O'Donnells was uh, was on Twitter, kind of having a go uh, at some of the decision makers, and um, you'll, you'll see it here. Like it's a it's a push, Shane, and it's a push <sighs> to the it's a push to the chest. Like it's no point in saying any yeah. different. The way the player went down was just a little bit embarrassing as well. Yeah, see, there's something here, right? Well, That's, the head. Yeah, to me, yeah, like I absolutely hate to see that. It was a, a bit like I don't know if anyone saw Leeds against Arsenal yesterday. Gabrielle and Patrick Bamford yeah. at the end. It was it was ridiculous watching the two of them roll around like a pair of Egypts. <laughs> <laughs> that sounded so like Father Ted. That yeah. dear, you know? It was it was annoying. Like it was so frustrating to watch. But at least they could go to VAR and say, "All right, these two lads are clowns." 
penalty isn't going to be given, the red card isn't going to happen, let's move on with the game. And like, do you think, right, so we use Hawkeye when we're in Turles and when we're at Croke Park. We don't have it elsewhere, so we don't use it. But if a game is on TV and if we have the footage and you can quickly look at that and go, okay, this was never a red card, it's actually a yellow card for the guy who went flopping on the ground. Should we not be using it if a game's on TV? Um, I think if they know, and you do know, six days in advance, that TV cameras are going to be available to you. Um, I don't see why not. It's just, the thing about it is, I was chatting uh, John Keenan about this recently. If it's not available everywhere, is, referee. Yeah, is it fair? Is it fair to but sure, just said the same about Hawkeye. Oh, yeah, I, yeah, I, 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 that, and it is, I don't know, is it unfair? Like, you know, that you throw Hawkeye in in Turles or Crow Park and then some other team gets, you know, serious injustice to them, done to them in some other grounds. Um, mm. But for the biggest games, I think you can't have something like this dictating where the trophy winds up. And I think if it's available to you, um, you should use it. And I saw something recently, um, or just last week, where a lot of counties have agreed to have their referees mic'd up for games that they're streaming. Um, and I think that's great. I don't know um, what the Crow Park rule on it is now. Um, and it's to help explain to the players and help explain to the viewers why a decision was made. I don't know what the Crow Park rule on that is because I know that after the Kerry, Kerry final this year, they basically said that you weren't allowed to do that. But So maybe mm. it's just something that counties have taken, uh, that they've taken on their own. But, you know, when we talk about respect for referees, and respect for officials, like the respect is a two-way street, a two-way street, and you cannot make a decision like that, a game-changing decision, unless you're one hundred percent, and to an extent, unless you have seen it with your own two eyes. Um, and I've no problem with a referee saying, you know, if there was an incident, someone struck out, lads, I'm sorry if I didn't see it. If I'd seen it, I could make a call on it. If I didn't see it, I think taking the word of somebody else for a game-changing decision like that is kind of ropey ground somewhat. Unless, obviously, if you trust that that judgment 100%, but that decision has totally changed the game and totally changed where the 2022 Donegal title uh, resides now for the winter. Yeah, but I think it's better to say, to sort of, I suppose, defer to somebody else who has access to the incident rather than adjudicating when you know you haven't seen it. So I think it's it's better to... to you know, pass it over to somebody rather than basically just ignore it, which is, you know, what that might be. Uh, let's just oh, no, what... if the technology is there, I think, Shane, you, you avail of it. And like I, I, as John Keenan was saying this as well, we're not using VAR or technology for everything, but he yeah. says referees are judged on um, red card decisions or dismissals, penalties, and probably goals. You know, they're the mm. three big ones. So you're not going for this free or that free. You're going for the big decisions. And you know when you're looking at a game, Oh, the Paddy Mullen stroke, you know, and that's a big decision in a game. There's a couple, yeah. there's two to three max in games. In some games, there's none. So you're only deferring for the really big decisions. Yeah, like for example, Liverpool, Man City yesterday, like they went, Man City scored a goal. And to be honest, I wanted Man City beaten because, you know, it's basically a state sponsored team. And I'd like to, you know, with a human rights issue, I don't want to see them doing well. So when their goal was chalked off, I was delighted. But I don't think it should have been chalked off the way it was. Like it's four or five seconds beforehand. The referee's looking at the potential foul where uh, Haaland has supposedly pulled back Fabinho. There wasn't that much in it. I knew it was going to be disallowed as soon as it went to VAR because you can see the jersey being stretched with a, with a little pull. But the game had been allowed to flow throughout. There was, you know, half fouls the whole time being led away with, which is very different to soccer four or five years ago. And I thought in that instance, it's over adjudicated. So I'd hate to see that come into GEA where they go really far back into the play or a phase or two back into the play. But in general, like for, you know, the specific penalty incident or a specific red card moment or something like that, where generally play is held up anyway, I think there's no reason to not uh, go back on it. Just on that chain as well, rugby's turned into a bit of a disaster now, as in the games go on. Forever. Well, yeah, that's because of the rules and, and the general fair. Never mind all the stoppages. <laughs> Yeah, but the um like the games go on forever now because they're looking at this and they're looking at that and whatever. Um, just the, the really big decisions, and in some games there mightn't be any need to go look at VAR at all. Yeah, which would be brilliant. The Cavan final saw Gauna beat Killy Gary two thirteen to one nine. Exciting finish there. Um, so or sorry, exciting first half. Ryan Ryan Donahue he scored the goal for the um for Gauna and um they never fell behind after going one six to one three ahead. 
Um, Martin Martin Riley scored a brilliant lob for Killy Gary after intercepting a kick out. So that was 10 minutes left in the first half. It was 1-3 apiece. But as I said, um, Gowna went in ahead. They kept their composure and uh, Connor, Bra Connor Brady was excellent at centre back. Um, in the second half, they st stormed seven in front. Man of the match, Keane Madden in full flight. Uh, Killy Gary brought it back to three, but a controversial free out to Gauna led the red and green down the pitch for a point to settle the nerves, and they immediately added another. Uh, star substitute, Oshin Pearson, put the final nail in the coffin with a lovely finish near the end. So Gauna were ser uh, senior champions in 96 and 97. They were honoured at half time. One of those was Desi Brady, whose son Oshin was full forward for Killy Gary. And uh, there was another tweet you had sent me about one of the players yeah, still yeah. playing. Yeah, do you have that there? Yeah, I have it here. It's a tweet from Arthur Sullivan, and this is brilliant. This is basically a Mark McKeever appreciation tweet. So he just says, Mark McKeever, what a legend. Uh, here he is way back in 2000. So there's a picture of him in October 2000, still an under 16, starring for Gauna seniors in Ulster, a Cavan senior football champion in 99, 2000, 2002, and 2022. And he was outstanding today too. Not many in the country rival what he has done. Ridiculous stuff. And a great comment from Paul Fitzpatrick of the, the Anglo-Celt. Uh, he, he, could, he could be, possibly, he says, the first man to miss being introduced to the crowd at halftime in a county final for the 25th anniversary because he is still playing. So that would be uh, in 2024. Uh, were it to happen it's absolutely phenomenal it really really is and lads like that just to to stay going and we've talked about Killian Farrell and Sean Oak Farrell and our 64 year old earlier on like them them boys like there's no end to it and it's great to see yeah that's GA for you so the Clare semi-finals were on Ennis Diamond beat Kilmurray Bricken after extra time and penalties it was 2-8 to 111 and then Ennis Diamond won 4-3 on penalties Air Oaks off Cara Finn 111 to 3. Were Carfin in the Munster Intermediate Championship last year in the club? I feel like they were. Rings a bell, yeah. Either yeah, last year yeah. or the year before. Rings a bell, yeah. Yeah, so that's Aero gone for the double. So there's uh, the count, the teams left on for the double Kilmacud, Schlock Neil, uh, Aero. Who else did you say? Bars. The Bars. And there has to be a couple more there as well that we're not thinking of off the top of our heads. But we Rat obviously Oat, did a power Rat Oat won, Rat Oat won the football. We're beating in the hurling. Uh, my Cullen were on for both as well. Um, there's, uh, there's probably there's probably a couple more. Some achievement though, particularly where there's a big overlap of players. It's it's mad, really. It's it 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 requires some amount of organisation. It really does, and some amount of communication between two teams, particularly obviously in the vast majority of cases where there's different managers. Yeah, Nace would be another one that yeah. are that are still on for the double. Um, okay, Nace, so Nace have done the double and can do the All Ireland double now. Yeah. Uh, so the Clare Intermediate Final, Kildicer beat Cora Clare 10 points to 1-6 and Liz Canner saw off Kalimer 10-9 uh, in that Peter Carty Funeral Director for Manor Junior Football Championship Final. Newtown Butler first for Manor's 1-14, St. McCartan's 2-8. Then in Leitrim, St. Mary saw off Mohill 11 points to 1-6. You might have a bit of detail there. Yeah, obviously um, Eamon O'Hara was involved with Mohill this year. Disappointed, I'm sure, that, that they were beaten in the final. Um I don't have too much. I don't have too much more detail for you, Shane. But it just that Paul Keeney was man of the match, and by all accounts, he was the chief marksman uh, for St Mary's. This is their first county title since 2013. Uh, he was the main man, whereas Keep uh, Keep Byrne was the main man on the other side. Mohill led one five to three points at the break, but after the restart, it just turned around completely in St Mary's favour. Uh, they got right back into the hunt, and Keep Byrne, uh, Keep Byrne was very good, as I said. For, for Mohill, but uh, Keeney seemed to be the one. He kicked six points, five frees, and uh, the goal scorer, second name, just trying to get his second or his first name here. Uh, McGrail is his second name, anyway. I can't seem to see it here, but that, but that, that uh, yeah. that, sorry, that was, yeah, that was, um, and like it was a big, a big win because Mohill were probably favorites going in, going into that. Neither team obviously were, were in the county final last year, so a big win there. Uh, then we have the London county final. That's going to a replay. Uh, it finished full of, full of Irish nine points, saying Kiernan's won six. So we'll have a bit more detail on that. We'll be able to preview that uh, in Thursday's show. Shane just wanted to go back to Clare for a second, mm. um, and we had we had video footage of that point that won the Junior A Championship for the Scanner. I think we have we have it somewhere, but it was one of the most audacious uh, winning points I've seen in many many years. It's a it's a left footer, uh, a left footer, 
I have um, one of them here. I don't know if this is yeah. the right game now. So here's here's open. Is this? Oh, this is this is the Cora Clare kill dice for oh, This is the Cora Clare one. Yeah, this is an outrageous score as well. It's just great that we get to see all these scores now and streaming services allow us. And the fact that he did it without stepping onto the pitch as well, because that linesman was only ready. The linesman was only ready to put his flag uh, and call him back. But the what the Liscanner one was, you know, it was basically Paul Murphy for uh, East Kerry, except off his left foot and from a free. Like this, this is the one. It's the, it's funny, Shane, because when you listen to the commentary on it, they say all sorts of different eventualities of what could happen from this. But at no stage did he even consider that he would go for a point from it. And if you look at the effort he puts into it, like it doesn't look like he could maintain the accuracy with the effort he's put into it. But an absolute dream score there. And again, another man who will be well looked after in Liscanner over the, over the next couple of weeks and months, I'm sure, and years possibly. Yeah, he most certainly will. And the... Loud final was also on at the weekend. RD St. Mary's 118, Newtown Blues 115. Uh, first time since 1995 that Mary's are at the top of loud football. Um, just like the last day, out, Colin Murray's side needed a brighter start with a goal from Kieran Keenan and playing to type again. Newtown Blues would come back in control with five points in a row, but ultimately St. Mary's calmed down and won by 118 to 115. The Sligo final saw Tour de Strand. Is this six in a row or seven in a row? Uh, I think it was seven in a row. They seven, beat uh, yeah. St. Mary's 15 points to 13 after extra time there. So that's a bitter pill to swallow for St. Mary's. 17 title overall for Tour Strand and a 42nd game without defeating the championship since this era of dominance began in 2016. It's Bally Gunner levels of dominance at this stage. Yeah, funny. Um, and maybe one that sits under the radar a small bit, like 42 games unbeaten is some go on. It probably, um, maybe not as noticed or talked about maybe because they haven't went on a big run uh, in Connacht, but Mark Brenny, who I think is involved as a selector slash coach uh, under Tony McEntee, he's managing them as well. And it just again, it allows uh, the split season allows the opportunity for a lot of really good coaches and managers to go from county and go back to the club. Um, you know, I think uh, Declan Laffin is probably planning on doing it with, with Clock Balakala from what he said to me in recent weeks, and he said it's, it's basically all about who you have steering the ship when you're not there. So if you if you have a good backroom team around you that can keep the show on the road, maybe while you're with county while you're with the county, you can slip back in seamlessly enough, and you probably have a good six weeks to build up uh, for championship after the county finishes. Yeah, Grodo Gakon says frustrating thing is that Aero, this is in Clare, have a better chance at winning the football, but probably can't go far beyond the county. Whereas it would be difficult for them to win the county hurling, but if they did, they'd have potential to go on a great run. The Tipperary football final was also on this weekend. Clamel Commercials won 10, Upper Church Drumban won 2. So that's a tough week for Upper Church, who lost the semi-final last week. Uh, the first score of the game was, it took 13 minutes for that. And that was a goal, uh, that was a goal. I'm just checking who scored the goal. Oh, it was Parik Lurum, who scored that goal in, in the 13th minute. And it was 1-8 to, to 0 after 28 minutes. So the game was pretty much done at that stage. Now, obviously, Upper Church stayed going, but ultimately, you know, it just... I mean, at that, to score one two in a county final is kind of disappointing. And but Clonmel are the sort of team that put other sides to the sword, especially in, when they're appearing in their first county final. I was at the J.K. Brackens one a few years ago, and you know there was a fair old gap between the two teams here. And you know, I I just think that commercials just had that bit too much class, and they're a team that's probably looking more towards even a, a monster championship run. Yeah, there was uh, obviously won that Munster uh, then a few years ago and Quinlevin pulled on that ball on the ground and got that great goal. And they probably should have beaten Ballyboden in that semi-final in Port Leash realistically in normal time. And Ballyboden went on and won the All-Ireland. But they have a bit of a point to prove. They were obviously hit with a bit of a sucker punch in last year's final. And I believe Jack Kendy was very good. Um, you know, obviously with, with Quinlevin. Like you go down to their team, Jason Lonergan, like they've a lot of, you know, they've a lot of names that are regular that were regulars or are still regulars uh with the tip seniors. So they'll find their chances on going a, a bit of a run there. And in the intermediate football final, Balna had a nine points to one two win over Mullinahon. Again, probably not classic stuff, but they won't uh, they won't care too much in Balna there. Uh in Waterford would fly through the quarterfinals as well. So Rat Gormock uh, beat Port Law eleven points uh, to two three. So this is a bit of a mad one. Rat Gormock were one to one hundred favourites going into this game. But they needed a late score from Waterford Hurley, Billy Power, to 
take the lead in the 58 minute against Port Law and eventually came through. So if you had them in an accumulator or you had a thousand on to win a tenner, you would have been fairly, uh, you would have been fairly um, bricking it Squeaky there. Time. Yeah, you would have been bricking it there, should we say. And I say bricking it because I'm looking at the next result, which is the Nier 217, Ricky Rangers, uh, six points. Jamie Barron returned for his first game in the year, scoring three points in the first half. And Conor Gleeson uh, finished with one three. Both very, very good hurlers, but very accomplished footballers as well. Uh, Galtier beat Clashmore Kinsale Beg, 13 points to eight. And Ballon Accorti had an eight points to four win against Killer Santi. Uh, Conor Prunty was missing through injury, while Neil Montgomery got a straight red card. So uh, the semi finals now set up the same semi final pairings for the last three years. So it's Rat Gormack against Galtier. And the Nair against Ballon Accorti, they have met in the semi final. This is to be their fifth year in a row to meet in the semi final. So I say Ballon Accorti are sick of this. Ballon Accorti and the Nair are sick of the sight of each other, but they're going to have to see each other once again. Um, you might just fly through Westmead and Wexford. Yeah, so the intermediate football final replay in Westmead was Shandona 2 8, Tubber Clare 1 7, and the junior two football final saw Moat All Whites beat uh, Carlstown Kinnegad by 13 points to 2 6. In the Wexford Senior Football Final, Castletown beat uh, Shelmanears. They had a very dominant second half performance, pulled off a huge shock victory, I suppose, beating Shelmanears, who were very good in Leinster last year. The Intermediate Eight Football Final saw St. Avon Adamstown beat Clock Bon 113 to 12. The Intermediate Clock Bon? Clock Bon? Yeah. Okay. Uh, no, there's, it's, there's so many silent things within clubs and parishes around the country. My, my belly Normally, few. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, St. Moog's beat Horswood 3 9 to 3 7 in the intermediate final. Horswood, huh? Horswood, I would have thought it was Horswood. Go on, someone will correct me there. Buffers Alley beat Shamaliers in the junior A final and the other junior final, Monagir Boulevard 7, Sarsfields 3. And then I, I, I definitely wanted to talk about this game and goal game study before we finish up. Um, the last thing before we talk about goal of the week, uh, I'll try and bring it up on screen here and get people's thoughts on it. So this is the goal game finding. Uh, this is from Cork GDA, Colin Crowley. And he's saying, this year we moved our under sevens and under eights to five aside, down from the recommended seven aside. Here's a small thread on the process and results. As you can see from the graphics, the findings were similar in both codes. So um, do, do you want to run through a little bit of that or will I go through the thread? I'd say you can probably see it a bit better than I can, Shane. Okay, so the five aside on the left here, there's more one on ones, more individual battles for the ball, uh, more goal chances, almost twice, twice as many shots on goals in terms of multiple touches, every third, multiple touches to the ball, more individual skills, uh, more clean ground strikes, frontal blocks, shoulder clashes, and dribbles. So on the seven aside, so obviously they're looking at five aside being that bit better in terms of every player getting a chance, more rucks at seven aside, more rucks with three or more players involved, less positional movement, backs tended to stay back and forward, stay forward. No ball contact. Some players did not touch the ball in some games. Spread out a thousand percent more shouts are spread out from mentors. And in references at the bottom, matches were recorded in two venues, providing 60 minutes of footage, 30 minutes of five aside, and 30 of seven aside with 12 different teams used. And yeah, so it does seem like five aside uh, definitely has its advantages in terms of giving everyone a chance. Yeah, uh, just I think the touches is a big one. More exposure mm. to touches of the ball, getting better. Um, probably an awful lot more movement as well. Positions a lot more fluid, like they are in the senior game. I know it's not supposed to resemble that, but you're probably moving from defence to attack and defence to attack and up and down the pitch. Uh, and with five aside, realistically, like no one's going to be left out at all. The chances of you being left out at all are uh, very, very unlikely. The only thing about it is, uh, is that with five aside, you're probably going to need more mentors because it's potentially, like if you're playing five aside, that means if you have like 25 kids, you're probably going to have to be playing three to four, maybe five goal games side by side by side by side to make sure that everybody's catered for. How would they go in, in Kilmacud or somewhere like that where, like, how many games are you going to play? How many mentors are you going to need? But that's probably an edge case, really. Like, in general, clubs are that bit smaller, I would say, across the board that it could be facilitated. Yeah, maybe so. It just, it, there'd probably be more space than it may be needed. But I think the principles of it and... Uh, kids get more touches, more chance to be in the game. Like you're, you're going to enjoy the game when you're around the ball more, aren't you? When oh, you feel like you're involved in the game. Um, so I think it makes sense, particularly when it's not competitive. Uh, it doesn't yeah. need to, it doesn't need to replicate 
what's happening when they get to under 13 or under 15 or whatever. It's just about developing fundamental skills, uh, getting them moving and getting them enjoying it. I think that's the key thing. They're going to enjoy yeah. it more if they get more touches of the ball uh, and they're more yeah. involved in it. And this looks like it caters for that brilliantly. Yeah, without question. Just to even look a little bit more at the thread here, Colm uh, adds, we decided to go five aside at under seven, eight, seven aside at under nine, ten, and nine aside at under 11. Nothing drastic, but two players less per team. We hope that this would lead to more uh, player enjoyment in games due to ball contacts, positive engagement, skill execution, movement, fun. Simple math suggests that all, uh, all these should happen. If 14 players play a 10-minute match, if all were equal, each player would have 42 seconds of meaningful ball contact. With 10 players, that number increases to 60 uh, minutes each. So what did we find? The charts in the first tweet tell a lot, but they also passed the eye test. The game was much more free-flowing, less rocks and more clean strikes and kicks. Players were finding less players tackling them when they had no ball. Uh, dominant players were still dominant players, but had less impact on games. How so? When a dominant player kicked or struck the ball in their back line, there would be at least one pass to play before he re-engaged at five side, while at seven side, the rock formed and he got in again. The ball moved up and down the field faster as well. There were less immediate interceptions from kick or puck outs. Two is, uh, um, players created a lot more space, even on a smaller pitch. So there's a bit more detail there if you want to check out that thread. But it certainly is interesting, and I, I'd be interested to know what people think across the board that are watching the show. And just to add to you, he's right. It's Horswood, pronounced like the Lady of the Night. I didn't think you were going to bring that comment up onto the screen, to be honest with you. Hey, but look, why wouldn't I? <laughs> if, it was, if it was Sean O'Sullivan you wouldn't have brought it up because you, you would have thought you were getting caught out. Yeah, everyone remembers the famous uh, trap that was set for me before and that I walked straight into. Have you decided your goal of the week? I haven't. Yeah, we always catch each other on the hop at the end of the show. <laughs> Look, I suppose we'll, we'll probably give it to Ben Cunningham. I'm going to give it to In The Hurling. I am going to give it to, uh, let me think, in football, I would say... The main man for Gauna, Mark McKeever, because I'm a, I'm a softie when it comes to lads that have been around for a long time. He's now won. Um, he's now no, he didn't. He missed one decade, but he's won county titles in the nineties, the noughties, and now what? What are these called? The twenties? The twenties? Who yeah. knows? Yeah, but like that's phenomenal, and there's no sign of any finish in sight yet because he was absolutely brilliant for them over the weekend by all accounts. I give it to Paul Finley for the football golden oldies again. Yeah. yeah. Ah, yeah. Like, and I love the fact that these guys can still thrive. You can, like, age is, you know, regardless at, at club level, there's still a chance to, to strive or to thrive, I should say. And uh, the ground is just a bit slower. The game is uh, obviously maybe 10 to 15 minutes less taking in injury time. So it gives these chance, these boys a chance to stay fighting it out. And they are. And I just imagine the satisfaction in them waking up this morning, you know, just knowing that all the hard work was, was worth it. Uh, in Hurling, I probably just I uh, listen. I don't know how many times I've given him the goat now at this stage, but uh, TJ is like as Joe Butler says there, he's the fine wine that keeps getting better and better. Hmm, okay, so that's it from the show. Again, a reminder that the coaching clinic is on this Friday in Nace. You can check the link in the video if you're watching on YouTube, or just check the top of my Twitter or the at our game HQ Twitter. Reminder: We're brought to you by OrgaRetro.com. Great sponsors of the show, but unbelievable jerseys as well. You see us wearing them all the time every Monday, and you can see them up on screen there again. Absolutely brilliant stuff there. And the best place to go and get a Christmas present just coming up. Uh, that's it from the show. So delighted to, to have brought you yet more coverage here on our game from myself and Michael. Michael, we'll do it again later in the week. See you, Shane.